Hackney's this Sunday on Road to the White House at 6.30 and 9.30 p.m. Eastern and Pacific on C-SPAN. You can watch C-SPAN's interview with the Cheneys now on cspan.org. The USDA Inspector General issued a report today critical of efforts to detect mad cow disease. Agriculture Secretary Ann Veneman was also at this joint house hearing to explain federal efforts to safeguard the public. This portion is about three and a half hours. Well, good morning. A uh, quorum being present. Uh, the Committee on Government Reform will come to order. I want to welcome uh, the members of the Committee on Agriculture today and really look forward to today's joint hearing on the USDA's expanded BSE cattle surveillance uh, program. I'm going to recognize Mr. Goodlot as soon as he arrives, uh, but since he hasn't arrived yet, I'll go ahead with my statement because we have Secretary of Agriculture waiting. We want to get down to questions. On December 23, 2003, USDA announced for the first time that a cow in the United States had tested positive for bovine uh, spongiform encephalopathy, also referred to as BSE and more commonly known as mad cow disease. Most Americans are familiar with mad cow disease as a result of the European epidemic that hit its peak in 1993. As the committee charged with overseeing the federal government, government reform began oversight of USDA's former mad cow surveillance system and investigation into USDA's handling of the situation surrounding the discovery of the BSE-infected uh, cow. Uh, Jerry, we switched sides here. And for this hearing, Republicans are on this side in this committee. And it's just. I know these gentlemen. Yeah. They're generally <laughs> fine people. <laughs> but but I think I, perhaps we're comfortable here. Thank, thank you. Almost made other news today, Henry, with the party switches. <laughs> um, what's happened is usually Republicans sit on this side in the Ag Committee and Democrats on this side. But at our committee, we reverse it. So. During the initial stages of this investigation, the committee was uh, presented with information raising significant questions about the validity of USDA's statements regarding its BSE surveillance system. The committee was repeatedly told USDA's BSE surveillance program focused on only the high-risk cattle populations where mad cow disease is most likely to be found. The committee was assured that only downer cattle and cattle suffering from central nervous system symptoms were submitted to the Animal and Plant Health Inspection Services, APHIS, and tested for mad cow disease. Information obtained by the committee from USDA confirmed that not only were downer and CNS uh, symptomatic cattle tested for BSE, but ambulatory samples were accepted by APHIS and tested for mad cow disease. Specifically, the facility that slaughtered the BSE infected cow had submitted ambulatory samples for BSE surveillance with the knowledge and approval of APHIS officials working in Washington State. In addition, USDA's Office of Inspector General has completed an investigative report that states ambulatory samples were a part of USDA's mad cow surveillance program. These findings heightened the committee's concern that USDA lacked internal controls over its BSE surveillance program and the agencies within USDA, as well as over communications between USDA's field staff and officials in Washington. The miscommunication within USDA was highlighted in May at Lone Star Beef Processors in Texas. Again, due to confusion over proper protocols, a cow diagnosed with central nervous system symptoms was not tested for mad cow disease. As a result, USDA acknowledged a disconnect between APHIS and the Food Safety and Inspection Services, FSIS, field staff and officials. The committee was encouraged by the renewed commitment between APHIS and FSIS to rectify the situation and ensure the two entities develop a closer working relationship throughout the BSE surveillance system. Seven days after the announcement of the BSE infected cow last December, Secretary Ann Veneman implemented additional safeguards to protect the human food supply from mad cow disease, including a ban on downer cattle, which were previously approved for human consumption. USDA also prohibited the presence of specific risk material in human food. In addition, Secretary Veneman requested the International Review Subcommittee of the Foreign Animal and Poultry Disease Advisory Committee to review USDA's response to the BSE infected cow and make recommendations to USDA's existing policy on BSE surveillance. These steps, along with the FDA feed ban in place since 1997, illustrate the federal government's commitment to pr the protection of the American food supply. 
On March 15th, uh, the committee was pleased to learn that USDA was expanding its BSE surveillance program and planned to incorporate several of the International Review Subcommittee's recommendations, including a minimum one-year effort to better ascertain the presence of BSE in the U.S. <coughs> USDA will now sample as many adult cattle from the high-risk population as possible in the 12 to 18-month time frame, as well as a random sampling and testing of 20,000 apparently healthy cattle aged 30 months and older. The expanded BSE surveillance plan reached full implementation on June 1st of this year. The expanded plan is an enormous step in assessing whether BSE is actually present in the U.S. cattle population, and if so, at what level. We're here today to discuss the expanded surveillance plan, its implementation, and receive feedback as to how the initial stages are working. We expect small hiccups, as this is a massive undertaking for the USDA. However, given the proactive measures our government has taken since 1997, I'm confident that we'll not be faced with the same mad cow epidemic that plagued Europe. The Committee on Government Reform will continue to conduct oversight of USDA's BSE surveillance program as it moves forward. I want to thank the Committee's Ranking Member Henry Waxman for his efforts on USDA oversight, Chairman Goodlot and on the Committee of Agriculture for holding this joint hearing, and also the Ranking Member uh, Charlie Stenholm. I'd also like to thank our witnesses for their participation today and look forward to their testimony. And I especially want to thank uh, the uh, Department of Agriculture Secretary Ann Veneman for her participation leading up to this hearing and for her presence here today. Uh, Mr. Waxman is not here yet. Uh, so I'll, I mean, Mr. Waxman, I'll, I'll recognize Mr. Waxman and then we'll go to Mr. Goodlot. Mr. Waxman, five. Thank you. Uh, Chairman Davis, and I want to uh, thank Chairman Goodlatt and Ranking Member Stenholm for holding this joint uh, oversight hearing today. Uh, oversight is critically important for the functioning of government agencies, and I commend uh, both of you and all of you uh, for rising to that responsibility today. Since the first case of mad cow disease was identified last December, the administration has sought to assure and reassure the American public and our trading partners Numerous administration officials have promoted U.S. beef as safe and endorsed the effectiveness of steps being taken to contain the potential problem. I'm concerned, however, that the desire to reassure is trumping the obligation to tell the truth. In an interview on Good Morning America, just after announcing the first detected case, USDA Secretary Ann Veneman assured the public that, quote, we are taking every step that we possibly can to protect the country from BSE, end quote. Yet, at the time, there were many steps that USDA had not yet taken, including banning downer cattle and high-risk materials, such as brain and spinal cord, from the food supply. Even now, the administration is retreating from several important measures to protect against mad cow disease. Six months ago, the Associate Commissioner of the Food and Drug Administration, Dr. Lester Crawford, testified before Congress that his agency would act swiftly to close loopholes that allow cattle to be fed to other cattle. Since this is the way mad cow's disease is spread, closing these loopholes is important. But last week, six months after the original announcement, FDA revealed that these changes are no longer imminent. In fact, they could be delayed for years. In another example, Secretary Veneman assured the public last December that the detection of mad cow disease proved the surveillance system was working. She and other USDA officials have claimed that the mad cow was a downer and had been detected through mad cow surveillance that targeted downers. Yet we have learned that, contrary to Secretary's account, at least five eyewitnesses saw the cow walk or stand on the day of slaughter. At least four USDA officials knew that the facility that slaughtered the cow was testing ambulatory cattle, a departure from USDA testing policy. What the Secretary described as evidence of the program's success may be more accurately described as a stroke of luck. This hearing will focus on the Department's new surveillance program for mad cow disease. In the next 12 to 18 months, USDA will attempt to test over 250,000 high-risk cattle as well as 20,000 healthy adult cattle. 
The results of this survey are critically important to understanding of the extent of mad cow disease in the United States. But today we're going to hear from the Inspector General at U U.S. Department of Agriculture about serious problems with this program. USDA claims the new surveillance program will be able to detect mad cow disease even if there are as few as five infected cows in the whole country. Yet the Inspector General found that this assurance is false. USDA relies upon the assumption that the entire risk of mad cow disease is confined to the 1% of the cattle population who exhibits signs of injury or illness. But mad cow disease can occur in cows that appear to be completely healthy. The Inspector General also found that USDA is failing to test many animals at the highest risk for mad cow disease, those that actually exhibit symptoms of brain disease. So far in this fiscal year, over 100 cattle have been condemned at slaughter because they show signs of brain disorders, but less than half of these have been tested for mad cow disease. As many as 17 untested cattle were adult cattle with symptoms of brain disorders, the group at the highest risk of testing positive. In a five-state survey of cows sent to state labs for rabies testing, only 16% of rabies negative samples were sent to USDA for testing, even though this is also a high-risk group. In addition, the Inspector General has found that mad cow data collection is flawed, with erratic reporting that often lacks key information. The Inspector General has concluded that these and other problems, if not corrected, may negatively impact the effectiveness of USDA's overall BSE surveillance program, impair, it, impair its ability to perform risk assessments and program evaluations, and reduce the credibility of any assertion regarding the prevalence of BSE in the United States. It is essential that the administration correct these deficiencies in its surveillance efforts. If USDA fails to act, consumer confidence will plummet and our trading partners will not open their borders. We all share a common objective, ensuring that our food supply remains safe and free from any signs of mad cow disease. I look forward to working with my colleagues and the distinguished witnesses today as we strive to attain that goal. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you very much. It's now our pleasure to recognize the distinguished chairman of the Agriculture Committee, Mr. Goodlatte. I'd like to thank the here. I'd like to thank the chairman and ranking member of the Government Reform Committee for agreeing to conduct this hearing jointly with the Committee on Agriculture. The cooperation demonstrated in planning this hearing is a testament to the pro professionalism of our two staffs and an acknowledgement of the importance of this topic. As I'm sure the Secretary of Agriculture can attest, the Agriculture Committee has been rigorous in our oversight of the Department's BSE surveillance programs and determined to ensure that we're willing, uh, that we're learning what we need to know about our nation's cattle herd. While our interest in the surveillance program goes back many years, we redoubled our efforts when the first BSE positive cow was reported in Canada on May 20th of last year. Since that date, we've conducted literally dozens and dozens of meetings, conference calls, and briefings with the scientific and management personnel of the USDA's Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service, APHIS. This year, the committee has had a hearing and two executive sessions with USDA. These conversations have explored the operational details of the previous BSC surveillance program and contributed to the development of the current expanded BSC surveillance program. As the implementation of the program proceeds, the Agriculture Committee will continue its oversight activities with the goal of ensuring the highest quality outcome. It's important for people to understand that the nation's cattle herd is not a static, homogeneous collection of animals. It's a huge herd at over 100 million animals that is spread over a vast nation. There is a broad array of operations, cow-calf producers, dairymen, replacement heifers, cattle feedlots, breeding herds, show animals, veal calf production, and auction houses that range from a few head to tens of thousands. This diverse herd is located in every state of the Union. For example, there are cattle bred and born in Hawaii that are eventually shipped to California for feeding and slaughter. 
Additionally, this herd is constantly on the move. First, there is the normal buying and selling of everything from individual animals to lots of thousands. Each year, 35 million head of cattle go to market, which means there are 35 million animals leaving the herd and 35 million entering the herd. Over a million live animals are imported from Mexico each year. The Department of Agriculture's expanded BSE surveillance program is intended to take a snapshot of what is going on in this herd. The surveillance is not intended or designed to be a BSE preventative. While not a direct protection measure itself, it will continue to contribute to the policy process determining our BSE defenses. The results of these tests will help shape how we maintain or modify the protective firewalls already in place, which include import bans on live cattle and certain ruminant products, feed bans prohibiting the feeding of most mammalian protein to cattle and other ruminants, and exclusion of high-risk materials and high-risk animals in our food supply. When the cow was found in Washington last December, the Department was already in the process of greatly expanding the surveillance plan. In developing the new surveillance program, USDA asked the Harvard University Center of Risk Analysis to evaluate their risk analysis on BSE in the United States, had an international scientific review panel review our plan for BSE, and utilized information gleaned from the International Standard Setting Body for Animal Health, the OIE. In addition, rapid screening tests had to be evaluated and the necessary labs set up and arrangements had to be made with many segments of the beef production and rendering systems to ensure we could collect the large volume of tests the program demands. Even the process of announcing suspicious results in a way that does not needlessly royal commodity markets has to be contended with. It has been a tremendous undertaking and not without its ups and downs. On June 1st, the expanded program began. There is less than six weeks experience with the new testing program, which is on schedule, but has not even had a chance to ramp up to a pace that will ensure 268,500 tests in a year. Today's hearing is not the beginning of the Agriculture Committee's oversight of this program, and it will not be the end. I can assure my colleagues, the Inspector General and the Secretary, that we will continue our close watch of the program, and we have never been shy in suggesting how it can be improved. Again, I'd like to thank the Chairman and Ranking Member of the Government Reform Committee, as well as my colleague and Ranking Member of my committee, Congressman Stenholm, for working so cooperatively to put together this hearing. I look forward to today's testimony and to hearing the questions and answers about USDA's expanded surveillance program. It's now my pleasure to recognize the ranking member of the House Committee on Agriculture, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Stenholm. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I thank the uh, chairman and ranking member of the Government Reform Committee for joining the House Agriculture Committee today in the conduct of a very important oversight hearing. I also want to thank Secretary Veneman for being present today, demonstrating the seriousness with which the Department of Agriculture has been and is addressing the issue of BSE. Obviously, this is an important and timely issue, and I'm pleased we will have an opportunity to conduct some essential oversight this morning. The question of how best to deal with BSE surveillance has been considered by the House Agriculture Committee for many months. In fact, for years, prior to the identification of that single BSE positive animal in Washington State, the U.S. Agriculture Community, USDA, and the House Agriculture Committee have been considering how best to protect the, the BSE free status of our domestic cattle herd. The continued safety of our beef supply is a testament to the success of these cooperative efforts over the years. Now, in response to the identification of BSE in a Canadian-born cow in Washington State, USDA has further expanded their surveillance efforts. As noted, USDA has begun to expand their surveillance to sample as many as 260,000 animals in the next 12 to 18 months. It is important for us to help USDA to be successful in this work, and I hope this is the spirit in which we will go forward during this hearing. There are legitimate questions, however, about the manner in which USDA is going forward with this good work. Concerns about risk communication, sample selection, geographic distribution, and testing protocols have all been raised. 
I look forward to the testimony and discussions we will have this morning and the light they will shed on this important issue and how USDA is addressing these concerns. U.S. livestock producers are justifiably proud of the quality and safety of our domestic beef supply. Certainly, we will continue to maintain the ruminant feeding ban and removal of risk materials that together protect consumers from potential BSE exposure, should it ever occur in our domestically produced cattle herd. In addition, I know that we will all want to move forward working together to get the best possible information about the state of that resource. That is what this expanded surveillance program is all about, getting accurate information about the state of our cattle herd with regard to BSE. And so I look forward to learning more about the ways that this hearing will advance that effort and aid USDA in that work. Again, I want to thank all members and witnesses who are participating this morning. I look forward to an informative and helpful hearing. Well, thank you. Let me ask unanimous consent opening statements by other members uh, be submitted for the record. I ask unanimous consent the statements by the Center for Progressive Regulation and the Ranchers Cattlemen Action Legal Fund, the United Stock Growers of America, be submitted for the record of this hearing. And hearing no objections so ordered, and we move to our first panel of witnesses. Uh, we have the Honorable Ann Veneman, the Secretary of the uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture. Secretary Veneman will provide the committee with an update of how the expanded BSE surveillance program is being implemented and the new written protocols that are in place for the plan. Dr. Rhonda Haven, the Administrator of the Animal and Plant Health Inspection Services, and Dr. Keith Collins, Chief Economist for the USDA, accompany Secretary Veneman to answer questions. It is our policy we swear in all witnesses before you test off. So if you rise with me and raise your right hand. Tell me, uh, swear the testimony you are about to give to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you. Secretary Veneman, thank you very much. Uh, for being uh, with us, and you can proceed with your statement, your entire statements in the record, and so you can move to, to sum it up. We have a light there that turns orange after four minutes, red after five, but take what time you need. This is an important, pro important program. We're pleased to see it moving on way and appreciate your being proactive in this area. Well, thank you, Chairman Davis and Chairman Goodlad and Ranking Members Waxman and Stenholm and members of the committee. It is an honor to be with you today to discuss our ongoing activities to protect public health and enhance our food and animal safety systems against BSC. As indicated, I am um, accompanied today by Dr. Rhonda Haven, our APHIS Administrator, and Dr. Keith Collins, our Chief Economist. You will also hear from USDA's Inspector General today, whose office has made many recommendations to strengthen the Department's ongoing efforts with regard to BSC. The U.S. Department of Agriculture works to protect public health by ensuring the safety and wholesomeness of the nation's commercial supply of meat, poultry, and egg products. We take this enormous responsibility very seriously. In addition, USDA works to protect animal and plant health, and we take that responsibility just as seriously. My testimony today will focus on the implementation of our enhanced BSE surveillance plan, which we announced in March to collect the data needed to establish a baseline from which prevalence can be determined. However, before I begin, I would like to provide some background as well as a brief review of the actions the Department has taken since the December 23rd find of BSC in the United States. BSC was discovered in England in 1986, and since then more than 180,000 cases have been confirmed in cattle worldwide. USDA immediately began to study the disease in order to prevent its introduction to the United States or to prevent the widespread, epi uh, or to prevent the widespread epidemic that we have seen in Europe. USDA developed a response plan that has been strengthened over the past 15 years as the scientific evidence and body of knowledge regarding BSC has evolved. In 1989, the United States implemented an import ban, which was extended in 1997 and again in 2000 on live cattle and other ruminants and certain ruminant products from countries at high risk of BSC. In 1997, the Food and Drug Administration banned most mammalian proteins in the use of animal feeds given to cattle and other ruminants to prevent spread of the disease should it occur in the United States. USDA began a surveillance program in 1990 and for the past 11 years has met or exceeded 
international standards as outlined by the OIE, the World Organization for Animal Health, which is the internationally recognized forum for the development and review of standards, guidelines, and recommendations on animal health. In fiscal years 2002 and 2003, we significantly increased BSE surveillance levels with approximately 20,000 animals tested each year. In 1998, USDA asked the Harvard Center for Risk Analysis to investigate the risk of BSE in the United States. In 2001, its report noted that because of the actions taken over the past 15 years, the risk of BSE becoming a widespread epidemic in the United States was extremely low. As you know, on December 23rd, we announced the discovery of a single case of BSE in Washington State in a dairy cow whose birth predated the 1997 feed ban. On December 30th, just one week after the find, we announced further actions to protect public health. These included an immediate ban on non-ambulatory disabled, or what we call downer cattle, from going into the food chain, a test and hold policy which mandates that meat from cattle tested for BSE cannot enter into the food chain until test results have come back negative a requirement to remove specified risk materials, or what's referred to as SRMs, which can carry the infectivity from, from the food supply in order to protect public health. Further limitations on the use of advanced meat recovery systems, a ban on the use of mechanically separated beef from the human food supply, and a ban on air injection stunning. These new food safety protections were officially released in the form of an interim final rule less than two weeks later and which became effective immediately. In addition, we announced the expedited implementation of a national verifiable animal identification system. Our goals are to achieve uniformity, consistency, and efficiency across the national ID system. Also on December 30th, I announced that an international panel of experts would review our response and offer areas for potential enhancement. The international review team convened on, in January and provided recommendations on specified risk material removal, slaughter methods, surveillance design and approaches, feed restrictions, feed manufacturing and sales, traceability enhancements, and other areas that could provide meaningful additional public or animal health benefits. The team's re report confirmed the results of the epidemiological investigation as well as USDA's actions announced on December 30th to further protect human health. In briefing me on the report, Dr. Kim, the chairman of the team, described the SRM removal as the single most important action to protect public health. They recommended a strengthened surveillance program to test cattle older than 30 months in the high-risk population, suggesting this could be done in a one-year program. According to the report, surveillance systems targeting high-risk animals have been shown to be the most efficient way to identify BSC cases. In addition, the report said that testing of all cattle slaughtered for human consumption was unjustified in terms of protecting human and animal health. USDA drafted an enhanced surveillance plan designed to meet the objectives outlined by the International Review Team. In developing the specifics of the plan, USDA worked with the OIE. The current OIE standards provide criteria for establishing the BSE risk status of a country or zone based on risk assessment identifying all potential factors for BSE occurrence. For animal surveillance, the OIE recommends targeted sampling of cattle that display clinical signs compatible with BSE and cattle that have died or been killed for reasons other than routine slaughter. According to the OIE, surveillance should focus primarily on cattle over 30 months of age in these higher risk categories. As I mentioned, the United States has met or exceeded the international guidelines for BSC surveillance in cattle since 1993. USDA determined that at least 268,500 samples would be collected from the high risk population of animals. The, the approach assumes BSC positive cattle would be contained in the high risk population. Sampling efforts were therefore biased toward this population in order to test as many of these animals as possible. The surveillance plan was reviewed by the International Review Team and the Harvard Center for Risk Analysis. In a letter, Dr. Kim, the chairman of the international team, stated, on behalf of the entire subcommittee, I would like to congratu 
congratulate you on this plan. All members of the subcommittee responded with positive comments, agreeing that the plan is comprehensive, scientifically based, and addresses the most important points regarding BSC surveillance in animals. <coughs> the comments of the Harvard Center for Risk Analysis were also supportive. In summary, wrote Joshua Cohn and George Gray, we agree with USDA's focus on testing high-risk cattle. They noted that USDA faces a challenge in drawing conclusions from its testing program for the prevalence of BSE in normal cattle populations. They suggested alternative approaches for consideration. USDA continues, intends to continue consulting with them as well as others as we collect the data. As noted in the International Review Team's report, experience in Europe has shown that testing high-risk cattle is the most efficient way to identify if BSC is present in the cattle population. USDA's enhanced program is designed to collect the majority of samples from the following categories. Cattle exhibiting signs of a central nervous system disorder, uh, non-ambulatory disabled cattle, cattle exhibiting signs of other diseases or condition that may be associated with BSE, such as rabies or emaciation, and older cattle that die on the farm for unexplained reasons. Test samples are coming from farms, slaughter facilities, rendering facilities, livestock auctions, veterinary clinics, veterinary diagnostic laboratories, and public health laboratories. Early data that we are getting um, Early data, data indicate that we are getting a representative mix of samples from these locations, and they do suggest that we can achieve at least 268,500 samples from the targeted population. This enhanced plan was made public and posted on the USDA website on March 15th. In just two and a half months following that announcement, USDA undertook extensive efforts to implement what amounts to a broad new surveillance program. I would add that our BSE response and surveillance plans have proceeded simultaneously with APHIS responses to other major animal and plant disease issues. These include avian influenza, exotic Newcastle disease, soybean rust, and sudden oak death. Each one of these has also required a substantial commitment of APHIS program staff and management attention. Between mid-March and June 1st, APHIS took steps to build the infrastructure for the surveillance plan. These included licensing of rapid tests, setting up a national laboratory network, testing and certification of laboratories, equipping the staff and holding training sessions, drafting con contractual documents, compiling a field manual, building an incident command structure, coordinating with interagency partners, and collaborating collaborati and collaborating with states, which are key to the success of this program. USDA's enhanced BSC surveillance effort would not be possible without additional testing alternatives and increased laboratory capacity to handle the volume of samples submitted as part of the program. To support this component, USDA has issued licenses or permits for five rapid BSC test kits. In addition, 12 public laboratories strategically located across the country have been approved by USDA to support the surveillance program. These laboratories are all part of an existing network of state and federal laboratories that assist APHIS with animal disease testing as needed. Because of their geographically dispersed locations, the laboratories have reduced the distance samples need to travel and are thus helping ensure a rapid turnaround time between sample submission and screening. Any inconclusive results on a screening test identified by one of these laboratories must be confirmed <laughs> at USDA's National Veterinary Service Laboratory in Ames, Iowa. The NVSL, as that laboratory is referred to, remains the national reference lab for BSC. The reporting and confirmation requirement by USDA is also providing appropriate and timely release of information regarding the screening results. As we have throughout our response to BSC, we need to carefully balance our responsibility to share information with the public with our responsibility to do so in a way that does not inappropriately affect markets. Throughout the planning and implementation of this plan, we have continued to strengthen the program based on our own analysis as well as suggestions received by others. To handle day-to-day -day management of the implementation, APHIS set up a national, up national and regional command teams based on the incident command structure headquartered at the APHIS State-of-the-Art Operations Center in Riverdale, Maryland. These teams are charged with making sure that all aspects 
of the surveillance program, sample collection, operational activities, and training are meeting the goals and performance standards on both a local and a national level. To ensure interagency coordination, these teams include USDA's Food Safety and Inspection Service, as well as state and regional animal health experts. In addition, we are coordinating closely with the Food and Drug Administration and other state partners who have been extremely helpful in providing their counsel regard, regarding implementation. We have implemented new policies to ensure objectivity of sample selection. For example, under new directives, samples are being taken from animals with signs of central nervous system or CNS disorders regardless of age and all anti-mortem condemned cattle except revealed calves that do not show signs of CNS will be sampled. Field staff have been instructed, when in doubt, take a sample. USDA is also working on a broad plan of outreach activities to help ensure that we are receiving all possible samples. A detailed instruction manual has been sent to the field staff involved in sample collection. We continue activities to inform producers, slaughter facilities, renderers, and affiliated industries about our surveillance goals and to encourage reporting of suspect or targeted cattle on the farm or elsewhere. Not surprisingly, given the scope of the task, our efforts continue to involve in order to assure the successful implementation of such an extensive undertaking. Our activities will include additional work with the Office of the Inspector General. The OIG has provided recommendations to enhance the program and raised a number of issues that continue to merit attention, such as, such as assuring adequate performance measures and management reports to monitor the effectiveness of the surveillance system and the need for consistency across multiple labs and IT systems. APHIS is also expediting its work with our chief information officer to strengthen the system to track and report testing data. USDA agencies are also working together to set up and conduct a quality assurance audit system. Our agricultural marketing service will begin a nationwide evaluation of the APHIS enhanced BSC surveillance program beginning tomorrow at APHIS headquarters and proceeding to regional and state offices later this month. These, this assessment process will be ongoing. In addition to our specific activities on the surveillance plan, USDA, in partnership with other federal agencies, is taking additional actions to strengthen our safeguards against BSC. Last Friday, USDA and the Department of Health and Human Services issued an advance notice of proposed rulemaking to solicit public comment on the International Review Team's recommendations as well as other related areas that have not already been acted upon. On Monday of this week, USDA scientists met with a group of interagency partners to discuss prion science research needs. And finally, the department continues to work with the Harvard Center for Risk Analysis to update its risk assessment and evaluate BS USDA's BSE response. In conclusion, we remain committed to, to continually addressing ways to enhance our systems and improve implementation. Our surveillance plan may find additional BSE positive animals. Notwithstanding, the U.S. has strong safeguards in place to protect public health. Removal of SRMs from the food supply ensures that the highest risk materials are not entering the food chain. By continuing the coordination between USDA and other federal, state, and local agencies, and by enhancing our science-based policies and working with our employees and stakeholders, we are confident that we can continue to provide consumers in the United States with a safe supply of meat, poultry, and egg products. Mr. Chairman and ranking members, we appreciate the opportunity to inform you and the committee's members of USDA's ongoing BSE surveillance activities. We recognize that there are many different ideas and different opinions about how we can achieve the most robust system possible to guard against BSC. I look forward to the opportunity to discuss these issues that the hearing affords us, and I appreciate the opportunity to be here, and we are pleased to take your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Madam Secretary, thank you. I'll start the questions, and I know you're, you're pleased to be here, and we're happy to have you here, but we appreciate your uh, proactivity in this area your leadership. I, I've got a, just a few questions. How many cattle have been tested as of today under the USDA's expanded BSE surve surveillance Since system? Since June 1st, just over 17,000. 
And now, this has put us on track with the number you hope to test by the end of the 12 to 18 months. Um, we have actually, uh, Keith Collins, our chief economist, has done some tracking, and at the current rate, we would anticipate we could collect the um, the 268,000 samples um, by in in the 18 month period. However, if you look at the numbers, we have continued to increase the number of samples collected each week. Therefore, we the the ramping up of the program is continuing. We're still in the early weeks of the program. Sure. So we would anticipate that uh, clearly we can stay at least on the 18 month schedule and and perhaps conclude even earlier than that. There have been some concerns given the voluntary nature of the surveillance plan uh, that you might not be able to meet the goal. Um, but you are seeing basically an upward trend at this point in, in strong voluntary compliance. I would say that our early data is extremely encouraging. When you think about the fact that we have collected over 17,000 samples since June 1st, um, and in the last two years we have taken 20 th samples in the entire year, this is 20,000. 20, samples, 20,000 samples in the entire year, uh, I think this shows that uh, we have been able to um, implement a program uh, very quickly, uh, efficiently, because we are seeing that the samples are coming in from the whole range of, of um, sample selection sites that I identified in my testimony, so you from think farms, it from, from uh, rendering plants, from uh, um, Diagnostic laboratories, uh, the whole range, we are getting samples in. So we are, I must say, we are very pleased with the preliminary numbers we have seen in terms of the samples that are coming in. We will continue to review those numbers um, and to evaluate to, to uh, make sure that we are staying on track. You think the food supply and the food chain are far safer today uh, as a result of what we have implemented here than, say, a year ago? Um, I think that's a fair statement, absolutely, because when, as I mentioned in my testimony, when you remove the specified risk materials from the food supply, as the chairman of the International Committee said to me, that is the most important thing that you do to protect public health. And so I do believe that the food supply is safer today. Now, OIG has. Uh the Inspector General has recommended uh, in their draft audit report that, uh, just a number of things. They've got a number of recommendations. You've noted that they merit attention. Uh, are you planning on implementing any of these, or have you made a decision yet as to which ones you may or may not? Uh, can you share any of, any of those uh, with the committee? Well, as I indicated, I think that the uh, Inspector General has made um, a, a very um, good set of recommendations with regard to where we need to place attention. Um, there are things that we have already implemented that they recognized as issues. For example, um, in the uh, discussion about whether or not we have tested CNS animals, we have put into place a policy that says we will test all CNS animals and all anti-mortem condemned animals, taking some of the subjectivity out of the system that the IG recognized as a problem and that we recognized as a problem, and thereby by um, uh, putting clear guidelines for those veterinarians who are out in the field as to what will be tested and what won't be tested. Uh, we have also taken, I think, made tremendous strides in, an, in another weakness area, and that is that um, our Animal Plant Health Inspection Service folks were not working closely enough with our food safety inspection people. Um, we are doing now joint trainings, joint conference calls joint memorandums from the two administrators. Uh, it is very critical that our two agencies work closely together in this BSE surveillance program, and I think we are on track to do that. We, as I indicated, we think that some, many of the OIG's recommendations also relate to the importance of, of measuring performance. We believe that is very important. As I indicated in my remarks, the Agricultural Marketing Service is assisting the Animal Plant Health Inspection Service in reviewing um, the, um, the plan, the implementation, the review of the various aspects, 
and we are working alongside the ORG as we do that and hope to uh, that we can be partners in that review of how we measure the performance and the effectiveness of this plan. Thank you very much. My time's up. Um, Mr. Waxman. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, Secretary Veneman. I'm pleased that you're here. Uh, assuring the public about the safety of the food supply is a, a complicated matter. Uh, it, it involves a lot of details. But let me raise the big picture to you, and that's the question of credibility. It's important that the job that is being done by this government is credible to people, both here in the United States and abroad. Now, um, there have been some warning signs that have recently come up about uh, the administration's efforts on mad cow disease, six months after promising to take important steps to protect the uh, cattle feed. FDA retreated. USDA also had to uh, admit in court that we let in um, million of pound, millions of pounds of meat from Canada that it shouldn't have. Uh, but today uh, we're hearing, and we're going to hear later from the Inspector General about a draft report on your new surveillance program. The Inspector General found many serious flaws across a range of issues, from the plan's design to its implementation from what the plan assumes to how the plan is portrayed to the American public. And I, uh, I want to explore some of those matters with you. One of the specific issues discussed by the Inspector General speaks directly to the Department's priorities and credibility. When USDA announced its new surveillance plan, the Department told the American public it would be able to detect one cow with mad cow disease among 10 million cattle. This means that if there are just five affected cows in the entire country, your testing program will catch at least one of them. That's an impressive and reassuring claim, and one we want to make sure is going to be accurate. Uh, one of the assumptions behind all of this is that mad cow disease is contemplated to be uh, confirmed in high-risk target groups and not present in all the um, healthy appearing uh, cattle. But this assumption has been called into question by many scientists. Today, the Inspector General, as well as Professor George Gray of the Harvard Center for Risk Analysis, Dr. Peter Lurie of Public Citizen Health Research Group, have submitted testimony indicating that, in fact, BSE can be found in cattle that appear to be healthy. So what I want to ask you is your response to this challenge uh, of the assumption that uh, we only need to look at downer cows and high-risk cows and not the uh, otherwise healthy-appearing cows in order to uh, detect every case of mad cow disease. Well, um, thank you, Mr. Waxman, for your question. And um, first, let me say that as we have dealt with this issue over the past six months, we have done everything that we can to um, give as much information as possible to the public. Uh, I think we tried to do that from December 23rd on and to maintain our credibility. Um, certainly, as you go forward, you you have instances where you look at things in, in greater detail, but we've tried to give the best available information that we have at the time. Now, with regard to your questions, um, let, me, let me just say a, a, a bit about how we have designed this program, and then I may ask the gentleman on either side of me to comment as well. Well, well Secretary Veneman, um, I, I want to go into a lot of the details of the surveillance program, but in the five minutes I have, the first question I'd like you to answer is whether you still work on, working on the assumption that uh, the target group of high-risk uh, cows are the only ones that need to be tested, uh, not uh, those uh, cows that appear to be healthy. Well, and let me, I was about to answer that question. I mean, we have targeted high-risk animals because we know from virtually all of the science that is available that high-risk animals are the ones of which we are most likely to find the disease. But we also said in the plan that we released on March um, 15th that we would, in March, that we would 
um, test a group, we, we said 20,000 of uh, normally appearing animals over 30 months. In other words, normal older animals. Um, so that you would um, get a sampling or a, a group of tests that would be targeted at the, at the um, normally appearing populations, as you say. But I think it's very important to recognize that it is most likely that we will have the disease in the high-risk populations, and that is exactly what we've tried to target. Do you think it is not, the it, time is a, it, it is what we call a biased sample, right. biased to, to the highest-risk animals. Just okay. in conclusion, do yes. you still think you can catch uh, one cow in 10 million that might have mad cow disease? Oh. Well, can you achieve that goal under the system that you've put in place? I'm not a statistical expert. I might have Dr. Collins just comment briefly on that, uh, on that statistical. I'd be happy to, Madam Secretary. Uh, Mr. Waxman, that assumption um, that you're referring to is one of a number of assumptions that statisticians made in designing the sampling plan. First of all, most importantly, that we wanted to get a random or representative sample. And questions have been raised about that that the Secretary just responded to, such as the voluntary nature of the program. Secondly, we made an assumption about the prevalence of BSE in the high risk or target population, and an assumption about the prevalence in the rest of the population. Well, where do those assumptions come from? Well, if you look at the history of the United States with the program that began in 1989, with, with a testing program that began in 1990, with risk assessments in the mid-1990s, with the Harvard risk assessment in 2001 and in 2003, all of that analysis indicated that the possibility of infectivity in the United States was very, very low. That's in the target population. Then in the rest of the population, it's extremely low. So what APHIS did in designing this program was develop a sample where they could detect uh, as few as five positive animals in the target population. Well, if there's five positive animals in the target population, there's a very low number in the rest of the normal population, they assume zero. It's an assumption. It's a working assumption to get the data collection started. It's not our estimate of the prevalence of BSC in the United States. That's the purpose of the testing program. We're going to establish the prevalence with, as the testing program completes and is done. Now, the point you raised is that some people have said, Okay, your analytical assumption may not be the best possible. Uh, there's questions raised about the appropriateness, I would say, of the analytical assumption. You mentioned Dr. Gray, and others have, have raised it as well. Uh, we, ref we respect that, and we have agreed, the IG has raised that issue, and we have agreed with the IG that we are going to look at this issue. Analytically, scientifically, it is an unsettled issue because you're talking about assumptions. So how do, you, how do you determine the relationship between infectivity in the high-risk population and in the normal population? How do you do that? Well, you can look I, at the I, European... Well, pardon I've me. Got if a, your assumptions are Mr. wrong, Waxman, however, the program your time is, is not expired. going to be as effective as it Gentleman needs to from be Virginia. to people the assurance yeah. that they need. Henry, I'll let you have a couple extra you. minutes. Yeah, I just... Uh, We've got to move on. We've got a lot of members who have questions. Mr. Goodbye. Madam Secretary, welcome. I am delighted to... Uh, have you as well as Dr. DeHaven and Dr. Collins with us today to answer questions about this important issue. Um, as I said in my opening statement and as, as you said in, in your statement, uh, this is a, one, a very important issue, but also one in terms of assuring the public of the safety of the beef supply in the country, one where the, the testing issue is one of indicating where there might be problems to address. Uh, and the department has been very proactive both before and after the finding of the one cow in Washington State, which I would hasten to note was born in Canada and born before the very significant changes in our feed rules were made several years ago. Uh, nonetheless, very proactive in making sure that additional uh, changes and uh, a careful review of the policy has been made. Uh, to make those changes. And I wonder uh, if you might respond to some of the criticism that the announcement of the BSE positive cow in December was not entirely transparent. I remember uh, the conversations that we had, and I remember seeing you all over uh, America's uh, television networks uh, talking about this issue and making sure that the public was, uh, was aware of the fact that this had been discovered and what steps the department was taking to address it. 
but I wonder if you might address the criticism that the disclosures of the recent inconclusive results uh, needlessly roiled the commodity markets. Uh, I don't find that to have been the case, and I wonder if you could outline the Department's thinking on how it discloses the information that it discloses. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Goodlove, for the, the questions. Um, first, as I indicated earlier in response to Mr. Waxman's question, we tried very hard to get the information out as quickly as possible with as much information as we knew um, and as, we, as it became available um, in the early days of the, of the discovery of BSC. On December 23rd, um, we had a press announcement the very afternoon that we found out about the BSC positive find. We tried to give as much information as we knew to the public um, without unnecessarily scaring people, but also to let people know that we did indeed have a case of BSC in this country. We followed that up every day with a technical briefing by Dr. DeHaven, a representative of the FDA, and a representative of the Food Safety Inspection Service so that people would get the technical expertise available to them that they needed and they would get updates on what was happening. As we implemented the program for the new testing, we are using what are called rapid tests. Let me, let me ask you an additional question as a part of the rapid test. It's my understanding that the rapid test kit manufacturer recommends running tests in duplicate to avoid misreporting of false positives, of which we've now had uh, two that I'm aware of. Uh, likewise, we're informed that BSE testing protocols in Europe include similar safeguards, and I wonder if that option has been evaluated by APHIS as a part of uh, your analysis of how to proceed. Um, let me just respond to that question first. and, and that. It was determined by the scientists at APHIS that as we initially began using this test, we ought to um, determine that an inconclusive was, was one that was um, obtained after one test. Uh, as you indicate that the, recommend, the recommended means by which this test should be used is you repeat the test before you determine it to be an inconclusive. But because this was a new program, APHIS made the determination that they should deem an inconclusive to be an inconclusive after one test. That being said, the, the test, the, the sample is then immediately sent to the laboratory in Ames, Iowa um, for further testing using what's called the gold standard. Now, with regard to uh, announcing these inconclusives, we had several discussions about how we should, how and whether or not we should release information about inconclusives. The determining factor in our discussion was the potential market impact of an inconclusive result pending and um, being. being Madam Secretary, my time's about to expire. Let me ask one more question, then you can respond to that and finish that one as well. And then I'll try to stay within the rules here. In ruling against APHIS's October 2003 and April 2004 revisions to the list of eligible low-risk Canadian meat products, the judge challenged the agency's risk assessment. Regardless of the process errors that you have already acknowledged, would importation of products listed in the October or April revisions significantly increase risk to human or animal health? No. Um, those, uh, the products were all products from approved products and all had valid permits. Um, but if I might just say that we, th about the inconclusives, we did decide to announce those inconclusives based upon the potential market impact if, the, if it were to leak out during that four to seven period it take, day period that it takes to retest with the gold standard test, that that would have a significant market impact and it was determined particularly after cons consultations with the CFTC that the policy we implemented was the appropriate one. But you'll continue to evaluate whether or not uh, two tests would eliminate uh, many of the false positives uh, and possibly review that in the future? Yes, I think that um, that will be something we continue to, ve to evaluate, but in the initial stages, uh, the determination was made that we should, um, um, after one test, determine whether or not there was an inconclusive. But that will. We will continue to reevaluate that. Thank you, Madam Secretary. It's now my pleasure to recognize the 
ranking member of the Agriculture Committee, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Stenhill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to pursue the, the last questioning just a little further because many have raised concerns about the number of false positives that may result from the current rapid testing. Would you or one of your staff please explain how the decision has been made to employ this particular test and share in your opinion why you believe this test has been selected over any other test, particularly over any other test that might have a lower potential rate of false positives? Um, I'm going to ask Dr. DeHaven to answer this question, but I will say that it has been um, our scientists in the Animal Plant Health Inspection Service that have made the determinations about the tests. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Um, I would uh, start by pointing out that, in fact, uh, we've run, as the Secretary indicated, just over 17,000 samples so far and uh, have had two inconclusives thus far. Uh, that would suggest even with laboratories that are somewhat inexperienced in running those samples, uh, that we have a very low false positive rate, recognizing, again, that we're taking every action that we possibly can to, uh, to mitigate the disruption to the markets. At the time that we were ramping up for this surveillance program in May, at the time we had one test that was not only licensed but also uh, was or was very close to completing the field validation process. It's one thing to license or permit a test. It's another to field validate it, uh, where we're testing samples uh, as we would be testing field samples uh, in an actual program. So it was the BioRad test uh, that we had the most experience with that was, uh, uh, had been or was very close to being field validated. We have, in the meantime, licensed or permitted four other tests. We are, uh, on an expedited basis, going through the field validation process for those other tests so that at the end of the day, uh, we would, one, feel comfortable with any of those tests that might be used, and two, uh, that there would be a, an opportunity for a fair competition among those manufacturers for the testing market. Have any of these tests uh, been field tested in Europe or other areas where they've had a greater incidence of BSE? Indeed, uh, some of those tests have been used and used extensively in Europe to include uh, the BioRad tests that we are currently using. We do have, not just for BSE tests, but for uh, uh, all of the tests that would be used in animal disease eradication and control programs, a process where we license and then validate those programs. So while some of these tests may in fact have been used in Europe and elsewhere, we still go through the validation process, that quality assurance process within our own country and our own programs. Madam Secretary, as we heard in your testimony and we'll hear in other testimonies later today, the single most important aspect of protecting the human food supply from BSE contamination is the removal of specified risk materials, SRMs. Furthermore, Dr. Peter Lurie will later testify that the removal of non-ambulatory cattle from the human food chain will not greatly reduce the risk to humans. Having said that, is USDA reconsidering its across-the-board ban on non-ambulatory cattle? And in answering this question, with the ban on downer cattle from entering the food chain in place, it became inherently obvious that on-farm testing and surveillance would have to drastically improve in order to reach these animals in the high-risk population. How many on-farm tests have you conducted thus far? And are you finding adequate cooperation to conduct on-farm surveillance? Um, thank you, Mr. Stenholm, for that. Um, first of all, on the ban on, on downers um, or non-ambulatory disabled cattle that we put into place, um, um, announced on December 30th, and it was, an, it was put into place with our um, interim final regulation on January 12th. Um, that regulation is still in interim final form, which means we have received comments on that rule, and we are still reviewing those comments. I can tell you um, that my agencies have told me that one of the areas, it was, there were many comments received on the rule, and many of those comments received were on the issue of banning downer cattle. Um, with regard to the populations that we are testing, um, we are um, finding just in our very preliminary results, which we've um, analyzed in a preliminary way from the month of June, 
uh, we've found that we have um, obtained uh, a significant number of samples from on farm. But one of the most significant things we found is that about nearly 69.7% or something like that of the samples obtained have been from already dead animals. In other words, that would indicate that these are on-farm animals going to rendering plants, going to what we call um, 4D, 3D plants, and already dead animals would be the ones coming from the farms. So we believe with this 70% of the samples obtained number that we are, in fact, doing very well with regard to um, dead animals from farms. Thank you very much. Mr. Putnam. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I just want to say, um, as, a, as a cattleman, as, as much as a congressman in the cow-calf business in Central Florida, that this disease had the potential to decimate an entire industry. And it didn't. In, in fact, uh, the demand for beef is still extraordinarily strong in this country. People stand in line for two hours to eat a steak. They won't wait in the drive through for five minutes to eat a chicken. <laughs> the, um, the Adkins diet obviously has had a positive influence on that. But at the end of the day, this was an outbreak that could have totally undermined not just an industry in agriculture, but undermined all public confidence in government and government's ability to deal with crises and it did not. And I think that that is a credit uh, to this secretary and her department in the way that they actually responded to the outbreak, in the way that they communicated their response to the public, to the consumers, and to the press. And frankly, uh, it reflects very well on generations of, of sound management in the department and in government that builds up that public confidence over time. The, the Americans' public confidence in their food safety system is tremendously greater than it is in Europe. And, and it's a reflection of the professional, science-based approach and the open communications uh, that, this, that this department has, has heralded. And I think that you know, all of us can Monday morning quarterback and look for ways to improve on the next outbreak, and that's an important exercise to go through. But at the end of the day, it's also important to give credit where credit is due. And, and the due credit is borne out in the fact that there is still a high level of confidence. Beef prices are still uh, at, at a above average, not necessarily an all-time high, but certainly higher than average rate and good return for the growers and good value for the consumer. Uh, I, I just want to give the, the Secretary an opportunity uh, to, to comment on the decision about the, the Creekstone uh, uh, slaughterhouse and, and give us some explanation of the basis for, for the decision not to test and, uh, and give you an opportunity to respond to that. So I'll begin with that. Well, thank you, Mr. Putnam, and I appreciate your, um, your words of support for the actions of our um, people at the Department of Agriculture. Um, the, the Creekstone situation was one in which um, the, sla the slaughter company came to USDA and wanted to test all animals um, with BSE tests to basically use it as an assurance on food safety. And I think the first thing that's important to recognize is that these tests um, will detect a BSE-infected animal only about less than six months, six months or less from the time that that animal would show clinical signs. So from a food safety perspective in testing younger animals, it would not give any real food safety assurance. Secondly, and I think very importantly, the, as I indicated in my testimony, the International Review Committee report uh, clearly indicated that there is no scientific justification for testing every animal. Um, 
we have discussed that additionally with the OIE who agrees with that, uh, as well as other scientific outside scientific bodies, all of whom say there is not a justification. The only place in the world that this is being done is in Japan. And it was done in response to an outbreak um, that, that uh, was first discovered on September 10th, 2001. Um, subsequently, they had, uh, I think they've had a total of 11 animals. But as a result of their outbreak, they had a strong distrust in their food safety systems and consumer confidence went way down. And Japan, as a result, implemented a system that would test every animal. Now, there is nobody that will say that has a scientific justification. They did that as a reassurance to the people of Japan. And we have been in discussions with Japan to try to reopen the market. Um, and we are hopeful that we will find a way um, to allow us to continue to ship beef into the Japanese market without testing every animal as they require currently under their domestic protocols. Um, I'm not sure if Dr. DeHaven would like to add to that. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Uh, I think uh, you've done actually an, an excellent job of, of summarizing the situation. I would just uh, add a couple of comments. Uh, one, the focus on surveillance testing is just that, surveillance, to determine whether or not we have the disease in this country, and if so, at what prevalence. Uh, food safety is taken care of, as, w as we have done through the Secretary's announcement on December 30th, by removal of specified risk materials. So the purpose of testing is, is for, for, for surveillance purposes. Uh, because, in fact, it's a disease with an incubation period of typically five years or more, and because the current tests that we have available, as the Secretary indicated, will not detect an animal that is infected until just a matter of a few months or weeks before uh, they develop clinical signs and then progress to death, that in fact there is no food safety value. We would, for the most part, be testing animals under 24 months of age when this is a disease of animals typically five years of age or more. Uh, and, and then again, the test would only uh, test positive even for those infected animals during a very narrow window. So uh, there is no food safety value, but, but the act of testing would certainly suggest or at least imply a food safety value. The OIE, the World Animal Health Organization, recognizes that uh, for, for testing that we should focus our efforts first of all on animals over 30 months of age for that testing program and then target that population specifically those that are exhibiting CNS signs or other clinical evidence of disease um, such as non-ambulatory animals and that's precisely what we are doing. We would gain no surveillance value. We, in the international arena, there would be no value placed on the animals that we are, that we would be testing under the Creekstone scenario in terms of uh, determining what the prevalence of the disease is in this country. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Yeah, Chairman. Thank, thank you very much. Um, Mr. Tierney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Madam Secretary, uh, you stated in response to Mr. Waxman's uh, question that you recognize the assumption that all cows with mad cow disease will be in the high risk population may be false. If the experts are right and it is false, doesn't that mean that the program may not reach the claimed effectiveness of catching one positive cow in 10 million? I, um, I'm going to ask Dr. Collins, as he um, discussed this uh, previously, to discuss the uh, statistical issue. Uh, the, the short answer is yes, if the assumption is false. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I, would, I would say in response to that, and, and it, it's a question that Mr. Waxman asked as well, that we realize that there is a scientific debate about that assumption, that there is no one single right answer, but that we would like to work with Harvard, we would like to work with other experts in the field, and over the coming months, provide alternative assumptions, alternative calculations, and recharacterize uh, or amplify uh, what we have said at this point. Thank you. And that is also, by the way, one of the recommendations of the draft IG report. Now, you know, coming at this as a New Englander where we may not know as much as we uh, others may know on the subject, I know that in January, uh, Health and Human Sec Services Secretary Tommy Thompson and the FDA Commissioner Mark McClellan announced new policies to reduce the chance that cattle are fed to cattle, uh, the primary method of the spread of mad cow disease. Now, I know that uh, the direct cattle-to-cattle -cattle feed has, has been outlawed already, but 
for my information from reading the IG report, the cow parts or the protein pellets sometimes fed to chickens and some fall through the floor and they're mixed in with other protein sources of the, uh, the fecal matter or the feathers and then circulated somehow back to cows. So those have been banned from the use, of, that, that use of poultry litter has been banned uh, from cattle feed and you testified I think in January uh, 27th in response to a question that the ban of uh, poultry litter for cattle feed, you said, well, I certainly agree with the ban. It has been one that has certainly gotten a lot of attention and a lot of questions have been raised about it. We have been working closely with FDA or the actions that they have decided to take and are supportive of those actions. So I assume you support those policies because keeping the cattle feed, cattle, cattle from being fed to cattle is critical to controlling mad cow disease. Is that fair to say, Madam Secretary? Um, what we do know about mad cow disease is that it is clearly spread from ruminant to ruminant feeding. That means cattle to cattle feeding. Um, ruminants, f and, and that has been banned in this country since 1997. Right. But, I'm, but I'm talking here about, and I know it's been banned, and I think that's obviously an excellent right. idea, but we're talking now about poultry litter or, or other sources of protein where right. it might not come directly, but sort of the back I was side door. That. <laughs> Um, we only have five, I keep saying that because we only what, have five minutes. I'd like to get to the crux what of that. FDA, what, what FDA said what, um, was that they were, were um, going to take additional actions to strengthen the feed ban. Um, they, on Friday, was, they released a uh, advance notice of proposed rulemaking to get comments on exactly how that policy well, could be implemented. No, but let's be a little more frank. I mean, essentially, they pulled back from banning it, which is what they originally were going to do, and now they just said basically we're going to think about it some more and we're going to take comments on it. How do we get to that point from a point where first we were going to ban it, and I think everybody, including you, thought that was a good idea, to all of a sudden pulling back, and now we're just going to think about it some more and take some more comments? Uh, I mean, from the consumer standpoint, that's not a very comforting prospect. As I understand it, there was, there was um, some uh, reevaluation of what exactly the FDA would request based upon um, the, the recommendations of the International Review Committee report that came out subsequent to their initial announcement. They then began to look at that report along with what they had previously announced, and it we, was finally decided, again, FDA is not under the jurisdiction of the U.S. Department no, of Agriculture. you thought it was a good idea but, at one point in time. You stood there, and you, this was your quote, I certainly agree with the ban. So have you changed your mind? You no longer think the ban is important? No, I have not changed my mind. Okay. So I, I guess how are consumers supposed to have any confidence when we go from supportive of a ban to just pulling it back? It leaves us with the concern, are we more interested in protecting the industry, or are we more interested in protecting the, the public here? Why not implement the ban while you are thinking about other things that you may want to do? Why not have an interim protective rule that's reasonable, and you believe it's reasonable, and I think most of us believe it's reasonable, and then take your comments for further action instead of just pulling back and leaving it out there? Congressman, it's, it's really not possible for me to answer on behalf of the Food and Drug Administration, and I think that that question would be more appropriately directed at them. Well, my question to you is, do you think it's reasonable the time to of the not put has in the bag? The chair now is pleased to recognize the uh, gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Lucas, one of our subcommittee chairmen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I'm sure that we're all waiting with great anticipation for FDA to formulate their rule to address that, uh, the litter question. But for just a moment, let's step back, Madam Secretary to the question about the statistics and how we arrived at the decision about how many animals to test. And for that matter, whoever probably on the panel is best prepared to answer that. But could you give us a little discussion about how we came up with this number of animals and what the percentage of likelihood of finding was, and why we arrived, and what, to, what we hope to accomplish by our statistical service sample? Uh, Mr. Lucas, yes, I'll, I, will, I will try. Um, uh, leading up to the development of the current surveillance plan, uh, APHIS had been using as a test standard uh, that they were trying to detect uh, with 99 percent confidence uh, as few as 45 infected animals in the target population. That was the old plan. Under the new plan, they wanted to dramatically increase the detection level. So they went to about one-tenth of the 45. And they said that our goal would be 
with 99% confidence, defined as few as five infected animals in the target population. The target population is uh, roughly been estimated at about 446,000 animals. Uh, now, the total adult cattle population in the United States, that is animals over 30 months, has been roughly estimated at 45 million animals. So if you assume all of the infectivity is concentrated in the target uh, animals and not in the rest of the adult herd, which you've just heard from Mr. DeHaven is largely undetectable, um, then you would get this assumption that, or you would get this detection level that you could find one in 10 million. And so the debate here has been about, about whether that's a valid relationship to say you would have five in the infected uh, target pop five infected animals in a target population in none in the rest of the adult animals coming to slaughter. And it's, it's really the ones, the 45 million is almost, is, is not that uh, a germane an issue because it's, it's, they're, not, they're not presenting a threat to the feed supply or presenting a threat to the food supply. It's the 6.2 million adult cattle that come to slaughter every year. So the question is, what's the relationship between the five, the assumption of five infected in the target population and what might be in the 6.2 million uh, coming to slaughter. Now, APHIS assumed zero for lots of reasons. It's an analytical assumption to determine a sampling level. Other folks, uh, Harvard Center for Risk Analysis, have said, well, there's alternative ways to try and come up with a more realistic assumption. One way might be to look at the European Union experience and look at the relationship between positives in the target population and positives in the normal adult population. Uh, so what do you look at? Which, which country do you look at? Do you look at all countries? Do you try and find an analog country that has an experience like ours? It, it's not clear, but there's certainly some information there. Secondly, uh, Harvard University has a wonderful simulation model where they can introduce infected feed at one point uh, in, in, in the cattle population and then track out how that might spread into BSE in the animal population over a long period of time, then take a snapshot and figure out where BSE might be in the distribution of animals. That's another approach. That's a mathematical simulation model. Uh, these, these different approaches have arisen over the last several months as the university community and others have started to look at the APHIS assumption. And so all we have said is we have assumed zero out of the 6.2 million adult cattle coming to market. If you use the overall average European experience for the year 2002 and just assume that relationship between the infected, uh, the, the infected animals in the target population and the infected animals in the normal adult population, you would conclude there might be as many as two infected animals in the 6.2 million coming to slaughter. That's just one possible alternative scenario. Because of the debate that this assumption has engendered, we, we have agreed that we want to look at alternative assumptions. We want to look what the, at what the analytical experts have to say and see if we can characterize what the alternative assumptions might mean. But let, let me finish with this critical point. All of this discussion is not germane to our sampling program. Our sampling program does what the OIE says it should do, what the International Review Team says it should do, what the Harvard Center for Risk Analysis says it should do, it focuses on the high-risk animals. And regardless of the assumption we make about the infectivity level in the normal adult populations, it does not change our sampling plan one iota. It's useful information for one main purpose, and that is when all is said and done, and we've gone through a whole year of testing, if we find zero positive BSE animals, then we want to be able to characterize the prevalence in the herd the national herd, and that's where that assumption would come into play. If we start finding positive animals, then it's going to be the actual data that we collect that we're going to use to establish that distribution. So it's a, nice, it, it's a very interesting analytical and academic debate, and it, and it will help inform us as we move forward, but it is not germane to our sampling program, our attempt to detect BSC in the herd today. Time of the gentleman has expired. The gentleman from Minnesota, Mr. Collins. Thank you, gentlemen, and um, Madam Secretary, uh, welcome. And I want to commend uh, yourself and your staff for your response to this uh, situation, uh, especially in December. Uh, you and I were on the phone, and as I know you were with other members, and uh, I think you guys really were on the ball and, um, and did a good job. So I commend you for that. 
And on the uh, surveillance system, uh, I'm not a statistician or an actuary, so I have to assume, the, Mr. Collins, that what you said is correct, that you're following all the right procedures, and uh, hopefully this will work. Uh, you know, I think you've put a lot of time into this, and I commend you on, on the effort to try to better get a handle on what the situation is, um, you know, out there in the, um, in the um, countryside. But I want to use this time to follow up a little bit on uh, a subject Ms. Stenholm brought up, uh, kind of uh, at a time when we've got a wider audience and I, maybe we're on C-SPAN, I don't know, the American public to understand. Uh, I think you went, you did too good a job, Ms. Madam Secretary. You uh, went a little further than you should have on this downer animal situation. Uh, and I want folks to understand um, what this has done to producers and I think maybe bring up a potential problem. But, uh, you know, the system we should have, and I thought we had prior to this all happening, was that we should test these animals, and if they're not positive, that they could go into the uh, meat supply. That makes sense, and that's the way it ought to be done, and that's the way it should have been done. Uh, by banning these animals, a lot of uh, whom are just injured, uh, loading them or whatever, uh, you put the producers in a real problem. And I've gotten more calls about this than any other thing that's happened out of this whole situation. Uh, you know, we now have a situation, and I don't think it's been corrected yet, where uh, the, the butcher shops in Minnesota that butcher these animals for farmers and others for their personal consumption are not butchering the animals because of this situation. So what you've done is you've made these animals that are perfectly fine worthless. In fact, you've made it a situation where they actually have to pay money to get rid of them. And what I think is probably happening in some cases is that they're just burying these out in the back 40 or uh, putting them in a dump or something. Uh, so I think you've caused a problem there. So I think people need to understand that, uh, that the, this whole downer animal thing, it sounds good, you know, but I don't think it's really getting us any place and it's putting a tremendous burden on producers. And folks uh, need to understand that, and uh, I'll end that editorial with that. And I hope that we can do something about this rule, and I know you're considering that, and, and I hope we can. Um, the last thing uh, that I want, the question I want to ask is, uh, if we do find another BSE situation in this surveillance program, uh, or God forbid that we get foot and mouth disease in this country, I'm concerned about uh, our ability to trace back and to to get on top of this. How long did it take uh, for us to trace back the situation with this cow in Washington State before we finally determined where it came from? Um, I think it took about four or five days, about three days. Three days. Um, now, keep in mind that, and I, and I appreciate, Congressman Peterson, your personal interest in animal identification. And we appreciate the fact that we've been able to work with you as we look to trying to implement a reasonable animal identification system in this country. We share the view that this needs to be done. Um, what was important about the cow in Washington State is that it, because it was a dairy cow, it was did have an animal identification that was pretty eas easily trace traceable. Um, I think most of the large dairies in this country have animal ID systems, which makes that um, easier to do. Now, as you know, we are trying to implement an animal identification system in this country. Um, we are working through APHIS. Dr. Collins has been involved. Our general counsel has been involved. Our CIO has been involved because the technology, um, the legal requirements, and how we're going to implement it are all critical issues. And so we have this team that is working with APHIS to get this implemented. But you are absolutely correct. Animal identification is a priority. It's a priority for us in the department. I think it's a priority for certainly you and many other members of Congress. And uh, before we're my, yeah, Before huh? my time expires, I just want to say that, uh, you know, I, I appreciate what you're doing, but I, I still think we're moving too slow on this. And if we ever got foot and mouth disease in this country, uh, you know, in Joplin, Missouri, for example, where I'm told that these animals can be, uh, within 24 hours, can be on both the West Coast and the East Coast. 
I don't think we're in a position right now to be able to trace that stuff back quick enough. So. Well, and if I just might add, you're absolutely right that the animal ID is most critical for a very contagious, right. fast-spreading disease like foot and mouth. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. Mr. Murphy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank, thank you, the panel, for being here. Let's make sure I understand. You, uh, in selecting animals for testing, you randomly select. You do not do the entire uh, population of cattle. Do you inspect all um, downed cattle? Are all of them tested? Congressman Murphy, um, first of all, let me explain that, that our testing program is not designed to be a random sampling, but rather our intent is to test as many animals as we possibly can in that high risk population. So I it's not a matter just, of coming I'm up with. I'm trying to get to a certain point here, and in five minutes, I'm, I understand the point you're making, but there, and you have scientific reasons for how you do the selection, but all cattle that are downer cattle, are they all tested? Uh, the downer animals would be in that high risk population. We will test as many as we possibly can. Being realistic about it, however, some of the animals are going to go down. They would become non-ambulatory on the farm. We may never know about some of those animals and may never have an opportunity to test them. Well, uh, what I understand from some of the farmers in my district that if you have a downer cow or downer cattle, uh, and as long as they're not going to the food supply, no one has to alert anybody to test them. Is that true? There is no requirement to report a non-ambulatory animal. Okay, so uh, a, an a non-ambulatory cattle may have uh, BSD, but we wouldn't know if there's no requirement for any testing to be done, correct? Possible. And, and, and that goes to the statistical issues and the statistical basis for our sampling, knowing what that overall total population of high-risk animals is that would include non-ambulatory, whether we catch every one of them or not, if we can test enough of them, okay. then we have statistical validity uh, about what we can say about the prevalence of the Are you trying to do the disease. testing before they get to the slaughterhouse? Well, we'll there's a number of collection sites uh, that would include um, you, animals that, that become non-ambulatory at slaughter on the farm. Some are euthanized and go to renders. Do you do some testing? Um, uh, in a collective way of materials, for example, central nervous system materials of cattle uh, en masse at a slaughterhouse. For example, if there's been a thousand cattle there and, and collect a sample and then mix them together and you can perform one test, would that be a valid test of doing that sort of assessment? None of our testing would involve mixing of samples. They're all samples that are collected on the individual animal, identified uh, to that individual animal and tested individual. I'm, I'm just asking in terms of, I mean, how much is the cost per test to do this? Yeah, the, the, the cost of the test depends on a, a number of factors. One would be the cost of the actual testing itself, the test kit, which runs in the neighborhood of $15 to $25. Okay. More substantial is the cost of actually collecting that sample, getting it to the laboratory, and then reporting well, that's, I'm looking at the total cost. What's the total cost? Uh, it, it will vary depending on where that sample is collected. Uh, it would be substantially less. Give in, me a ballpark. Well, I think it, it, ballpark maximum would be $100. Okay, $100. What I'm just wondering here in terms of this, because I know we all share a concern for making sure that um, as many are, are tested. I just know it's done in some areas where you have um, a collection of specimens that may be mixed together. And indeed, you, one might have that if you're separating out materials in a slaughterhouse uh, that might be central nervous system materials. I, I don't know enough about the actual testing. If once you have a number of things mixed, you can go through that and then say, okay, somewhere in this last thousand cattle wow. that are mixed together, we, we've found a positive and we have to now backtrack for that. I'm just trying to think of other mechanisms that might work here in, in multiple levels in the food chain. Madam Secretary, you had a, you look like you had a comment on that? Well, I think it, I think it's important to point out that the only known means by which we can test BSC right now is through this testing from the brain. Okay. Um, that's what the tests are sensitive to. So it's not as if you can take a lot of material from random material from a slaughter plant oh, I understand. and I, test I, that. But I, I, my assumption is that categories of certain areas of the cow are not all heaped together. And I mean, I mean, excuse me. Some some categories may appear together. I, I just that's what I was just wondering because I know in other areas of medical testing, some of these things are done as a group. For example, blood testing. Uh, Congressman, you're 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 focusing on uh, animals at slaughter, and the animals that we would test at slaughter are going to be identified anti-mortem either because they 
um, are exhibiting central nervous system disorder because they're non-ambulatory or perhaps they arrive. Yes, but they could also be asymptomatic and still have BSC, right? I'm sorry? They could, they could be asymptomatic and still carry the disease, though, correct? But those animals that are asymptomatic wouldn't be targeted for our testing program. But again, good point to emphasize, public health, food safety is assured not by testing, but by removing specified risk materials, removing food from the food chain, any tissues that might be infective. So again, the purpose of the testing is for surveillance purposes to determine whether or not we have the disease, yeah. and if so, at what prevalence in the national herd. Food safety is assured by removal of SRMs. Yeah, ge gentlemen's time has expired. Ms. McCollum. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, my questions are some, somewhat along the same line. And to your point, doctor, about the only, um, uh, the, the testing is to find it, to see if the food that the animals are being given is safe, goes back to uh, Representative Tierney's question, then why are we delaying the ban? Um, it's my understanding that the tests are voluntary except for the federal tests that are conducted at the, uh, where the federal inspectors are at the slaughterhouses, is that correct? Yes, ma'am, that is correct. It's a voluntary testing program. And um, in Minnesota, when um, we received the information about going forward with doing the voluntary testing, um, our Animal Board of Health found that no money came along with it. So at their own expense, they sent out postcards with a 1-800 number to contact um, you. And along with that um, comes a uh, the disposal needs and other higher costs for people who are going to be sample providers. Um, and along the, the questions that the uh, gentleman just had, have you attempted to project these costs and determine how establishments will adequately and timely be uh, compensated when necessary? Do you have any time when we can expect information like that for our, our farmers? There's several issues. One goes to the voluntary issue of the program, and APHIS has a long history of successful uh, Sir, dis animal I, I, disease. Sir, I really don't mean to be rude, but I, I have one other s question, so I'm going to ask it now, because I, I'm afraid with your answer going into all the history of my Consumers who buy organically labeled meat products, it is my understanding that if I purchase an organically labeled meat product today, that the cow might have ingested uh, the the mature the, the brain and uh, won't have been BSA tested. In other words, that there's a point. I'm not saying this very very uh, smoothly. There is a point at which an organic label would certify to a consumer that a cow, in fact, would not have received any of the the food products that they eat that would have had the PSA. What is that cutoff deadline for organically labeled meat? I, I would just clarify that, that what, um, what you're suggesting with regard to what cattle can eat would be true for all cattle. We have had since August of 1997 but, but a feed sir, ban that sir, prohibits there, there's the... There's an assumption when people buy things that are organically labeled that they have a different meaning. And, and, organic, and organically labeled beef is something that I've heard consumers say, well, I can eat that and I don't have to worry about anything because it's organically fed. And, that, and that's a false assumption at this point in time, is it not? Um, what, what is important is that the, the, the current ban prohibits the feeding of ruminant proteins to ruminants regardless of whether it's or, you know, or an organic feed or not. I'm not familiar enough with the organic standards to, to know if it addresses uh, specifically what animals could eat. Um, some animals receive feed supplements that are typically protein supplements, but, but what we're saying is, and perhaps uh, some are suggesting by feeding organic feed, it doesn't include those supplements at all. Um, we're saying through the feed ban, whether there's a, uh, animals are fed protein supplements or not, that that protein cannot have originated from other ruminants, and that's how the disease transmission is blocked. So my question would be more, more appropriate to the Food and Drug Administration? No, to organic. Who, who's in charge of no, labeling organic? Let me 
we, we do, in our department, oversee the organic program. It is not under Dr. Haven's agency. Um, I think it's really important to point out that ruminant to ruminant feed, uh, feeding of animals cannot occur in any of the um, livestock production in this country, regardless of, of whether or not it's organic. The organic rules prohibit any mammalian protein to be fed to animals that are marketed as organic. since the uh, organic rules have been implemented, which has been the last couple of years. Right. And, Mr. Chair, At this time. I know my time's expired, but if they could provide um, to the committee uh, the, other, the other question that he didn't have to. All right, see, if, see if you can get back to us on, on her follow-up question. Thank you very much. We'll, at the conclusion, we'll hold the record open uh, to give uh, all witnesses an opportunity to respond to questions posed in writing. Uh, at this time, my pleasure to recognize the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I've been uh, uh, interested in following the BSE since it uh, uh, was first identified in 1986 in Europe. Uh, oversight is appropriate, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, however, there's some danger, I think, uh, to sending some confused signals out to uh, uh, consumers in the United States. Uh, the first one is that um, uh, if it's a joint committee hearing, uh, there must be some real danger out there. A lot of words have been said this morning, uh, uh, you know, can we can guarantee 100 percent or uh, can we do a better job of surveillance? Uh, I would like to try to uh, uh, make a couple of comments, maybe getting uh, uh, some of the hay uh, uh, out of the mow and down on the barn floor where we can sort out uh, some of the chaff. And Madam Secretary, I'd like, uh, in, in conclusion of my four points, to see if you agree with my four points. Uh, one, there's never been an animal raised in the United States that's ever been identified of, uh, as having BSE. What happened uh, uh, with the identified animal in, uh, in Washington uh, a little over six months ago was an animal uh, that was imported from Canada that was subject uh, to eating the kind of bone scraps and slaughter scraps uh, that, as a footnote, have been ad uh, identified as a way that BSE is transmitted from one bovine to another. Uh, this animal came from Canada. Again, uh, it was raised at a time before the ban went on in 1997 of using those particular uh, feed scraps. Uh, actually, uh, 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 the fact that every time, Madam Chairman, that USDA decides to announce a suspect is being sent in for further tests, uh, consumption, because it's sort of a scare point, goes down. So if uh, there's one question, I, I would or may, maybe one suggestion, uh, if you decide it's, it's the wise thing to do to announce that you're sending in a suspect animal for a gold, so-called gold test, that you make very clear in that announcement uh, that this animal has not been identified as BSE. And I knew you'd know you'd do it with one sentence. I think it needs to be more aggressive. We're disrupting a uh, industry uh, uh, in the United States because of the potential of, of fear. So number one, never been an animal raised in the United States that's ever been identified as having BSE. The animal, one animal that was uh, identified in Washington actually was imported uh, from Canada and subject to eating the kind of uh, 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 scraps uh, that have been identified as one way to transmit, as the major way, I guess the only way that we know of to transmit, uh, transmit uh, this disease. So. Uh, my suggestion is, with all of the words and comments said this morning, uh, that somehow we need to boil it down to try to tell the American consumer what the real risk is. And there's a lot of media coverage. The tendency of that media is to take uh, maybe the most bold, scary statements. So your reaction. Well, thank you, Mr. Smith. I, uh, I appreciate your uh, comments. And you are correct that this, the animal that was found in Washington State uh, was traced back to originate in Canada. 
Uh, it did, it was of an age, it was determined that predated the feed ban. Um, there was an animal discovered to have BSC in Canada in May of last year. Um, that animal was also found to have predated the feed ban, which hopefully explains how these animals would have potentially gotten the disease. Um, and that, that feed ban has been in effect since 1997. It is um, the means by which science shows us that the disease is transmitted from animal to animal. So um, obviously the, the ruminant to ruminant feed ban is a key component of our program here to prevent uh, the spread of BSE in this country. It's probably the single most important thing in terms of preventing the spread. If there's one further, uh, excuse me, okay. go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say in one uh, further suggestion, I think we need to refine the downer animal. The tendency is, of course, for most farmers uh, if, uh, is, uh, is simply to uh, maybe limit the inspection of the kind of animals that might be potential suspects uh, uh, unless we refine some of the rules on downer animals. Well, as I indicated before, the downer issue is in the rulemaking process. It was announced as an interim final rule, and those, those um, comments are now being evaluated. Um, if I might just say also that um, in terms of the announcing of the uh, inconclusives, we have no evidence that that has, um, has impacted consumption in the U.S. We have seen very strong consumption numbers here in the U.S. We've su seen some minor market reaction um, on the days when those were announced, but there was a quick bounce back as the uh, facts became known and, they, th and that they were deemed to be negative. The time of the gentleman has expired. Uh, it's now my pleasure to recognize the gentlewoman from South Dakota, Ms. Herseth. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just to follow up a little bit on the testing uh, and the samples here, you've talked about how you're targeting the high-risk population, and you just finished describing how uh, the case from Washington was traced back to Canada. Have there been any efforts by the USDA to take any actions to specifically identify Canadian-born cattle in the U.S. for this testing program if, as you've stated, the testing is more for surveillance, actually, than for food safety? In fact, associated with the two investigations, one involving the Canadian cow uh, found on May 20th um, in Canada, as well as the cow found in the state of Washington on December 23rd, there have been extensive epidemiological investigations ongoing in both sides of the border. As part of that investigation, a large number of animals were sacrificed, all of them tested, and all of them tested negative. So there certainly has been a lot of testing of Canadian cattle as it relates to those two investigations. We do indeed import a large number of cattle from Canada. Um, most of them, or many of them, are going to feedlots and then to slaughter. Many are, were prior to, uh, prior to May 20th when we imposed the restrictions, were um, going direct to slaughter. We also know, of course, that there's a large number of breeding cattle and dairy cattle that have come into the United States from Canada. And through our surveillance program, as they have been integrated into the national herd, they are subject to the same safeguards, firewalls, if you will, as our national herd in terms of subject to the same feed ban, subject to the same uh, removal of specified risk materials at slaughter, uh, subject to the same surveillance program. Okay. You know, over the past few days, uh, I've had a chance to talk with a number of my constituents in South Dakota who are producers about uh, the handling of the reporting of the inconclusive results. And there hasn't necessarily been a consensus. Some feel that it's been handled appropriately. Others feel that there was more than a minor uh, effect on the market. And they feel that uh, perhaps if there is any consensus, it's that if these inconclusive findings are going to be reported, then report all the information. I mean, where were these two cases that resulted in false positives? Were they samples taking at rendering facilities that no, had no chance of entering the food chain? Uh, if we have four to seven days from the 
initial screening tests from the rapid tests to the more comprehensive scientific-based test, uh, doesn't that give us time then to trace that animal back, particularly if it's uh, from a dairy herd, to determine the nation of origin of that sample? Uh, so I guess there's, there's almost this sense among producers and others in the cattle industry in South Dakota that either don't report the tests until you have the conclusive findings, or if you're going to report the initial findings that are inconclusive, report more information as it relates to the origin uh, of the animal, as it relates to the age of the animal, and as it relates to where the sample was collected. Do you have any thoughts on, on that as it related, as the Secretary, as you mentioned, you know, in determining uh, the timetable of releasing this information, that one of the, the primary rationale was the potential impact on the market based on the delay uh, bef before the conclusive test and the, the potential leaks that would be involved? Uh, perhaps I could start with a comment on the market and then ask uh, Dr. DeHaven if he would amplify on the, the availability of further information. This, this question about dealing with um, inconclusives, I was sitting here as, as I was listening to you, is the answer to that is sort of like the, the answer to the question of, you know, when have you stopped beating your spouse? We, 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 you know, if we don't put any information out uh, and it gets leaked into the marketplace, then we're, I think, be quite criticized for not providing information to the market. They'll be creating uncertainty on the part of the government for not providing information. Uh, on the other hand, I think if we provide too much information, uh, we might be getting ahead of ourselves, uh, such as identifying the, the location of the sample, as you mentioned. Uh, uh, but wait a minute, if, if I could stop you there for just yeah. a second, because it gets at some of the other questions that were being asked as it relates to, uh, I think it was Congressman Smith's questions about the consumer's reaction to right. this, and perhaps right. there isn't evid any evidence as yet yes. that there's been a reduction in consumer consumption, but yeah. if we don't know, if, if the public doesn't know in the reporting that the sample was collected at a, a facility in which the particular animal being tested had no chance of entering the food supply. Well, wouldn't that be somewhat helpful as it relates to minimizing the market impact? I, I, I guess let me just make one comment about the market impact, and then I will turn it over to Dr. DeHaven to, to, to address that rest of the question. With regard to the market impact, you mentioned the Secretary's characterization of the impact being minor. Um, what, what happened when we first released the inconclusive on uh, June 25th, the next trading day was Monday on the 28th, the market went down roughly 3 percent. The day after that, the market went up roughly 1.5 percent. Uh, and then on Wednesday, uh, on June 30th, was the next trading day after we announced the second inconclusive on the night of the, the 29th. Uh, the market went down again roughly 1.5 to 2.5 to percent that day, and the market was mixed for quite a bit after that. One of the notable things, I think, about that is what the market we're talking about is the futures market. During that period of time when the market dropped, if you look at any of the trade commentary on what was happening in cash markets, producers were not selling their animals. They were sitting waiting to see if the, the, the inconclusive issue would be resolved. So the question of how much money was lost by producers, is, is the answer to that is not really clear, the market mm -hmm. impact, because we know that trading was very light uh, on the days after the inconclusives were reported. Now, with, with respect to um, how much information we should be reporting, I'll give that easy question to Dr. DeHaven. Okay, and if I could just make one other comment on the flip Gen side. Gentlelady's time's expired. We'll let them answer your questions, then we need to move on. Thank you. Uh, I, I think it's, Briefly. it's important, uh, first and foremost, to point out the fact that by definition, these animals are not going into the human food supply. Whether they are animals with CNS signs, non-ambulatory, or obviously dead animals, they are not going into the human food supply. The only potential would be when we ramp up our testing of normal slaughter animals, and, and even then we will have a, a policy of holding those carcasses pending a negative test. When we announce these inconclusives, we make it a point to say that these animals have not entered the human food chain. So there is no public health issue with regard to those particular animals. I, I would also point out that so far, out of 17,000 plus or minus animals that have been tested, we've only had two inconclusives. I don't want to minimize the impact on the markets of reporting those, uh, but, but in fact, that's not a, a large number given the number of animals that we've tested. And, and we would, and, and Keith does a more uh, thorough job than I do of explaining that the impact on the market is certainly minimized by us reporting it as opposed to us trying to uh, 
minimize the impact of, a leaked, inf of leaked information. If we were to report the location of these inconclusive samples, uh, we think that there's a couple of bad precedents that we would set. First of all, an inconclusive that confirms negative is simply a negative test. It, it's no different than any other t um, sample that we test that, that turns out to be negative. So we, we don't think it's appropriate to handle those animals any differently, uh, assuming that we get negative confirmatory test results. Second, if we were to report the location of those samples, then in fact we can suggest or guess that that producer or that renderer or that slaughter plant and even the laboratory where the sample was tested would be subject to a lot of scrutiny um, by the media and could in fact damage what has been up to this point excellent cooperation from all of the industries that we are working with. Uh, from the laboratories to the renderers to the slaughter plants uh, to the producers and uh, several other industries that I'm um, probably failing to mention, we've had excellent cooperation. We don't want to do anything by prematurely reporting information that could damage that excellent cooperative relationship that we currently enjoy with the industries that we're working with and, in fact, must have if this is going to be a successful program. Okay, thank you very much. Mr. Rosie. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to uh, examine a couple things, but before I do, I want to get in the record some empirical data. Uh, Mr. Chairman, on your leadership, one of the agencies over which we have oversight is USDA, and one of the issues we've followed most closely, quietly, is this issue of BSE in the cattle herds. Uh, one of the things we have dug out, which, by the way, for everybody's edification, one of the most informative websites you can go to is the one that APHIS puts up under the USDA uh, website, where it actually tracks historically the number of tests that have been done over the past 10 or 12 years. And if you look at uh, that website, you'll find that under the BSE surveillance programs that have been in place since May of 1990, the only true uh, focus that has been put on this issue has been under Secretary Veneman's leadership. And I would cite for you the numbers of tests that have actually been done and I'm going to go by year. 1990, there were 40 tests done. 1990, I'm not talking, I'm talking in the entire herd. 40 tests for BSE done. 1991, 175. 1992, 251. 93, 736. 1994, 692. 95, 744. 1996, 1143. In 1997, concurrent with the FDA ban on the feedstock, 2,713, then in 1998 it fell to 1,080, in 1999, 1,302, in the year 2000, 2,681. Now, when Secretary Veneman came into office, 5,272 were do done in 2001. In 2002, 19,990 were done. In 2003, 20,543. In 2004, it tailed off a little bit, 15,513. The point of reciting these numbers is to show that for the first time since the early 90s, we have, in fact, got somebody on the job who's paying attention to this, trying to protect the consumer from buying beef that's otherwise tainted with BSE. In addition to that, one of the things that the USDA has done is instead of relying on a single lab located in Ames, Iowa, they have authorized testing to be done by now 12 newly approved labs, seven of which have been approved quite, is it five or seven of which just quite recently. Uh, the uh, USDA has also gone and imposed uh, under an interim rule the removal of specified risk material, a test and hold policy for any suspect carcasses. They're working on an animal ID system that will actually be uh, efficient. I put this in the record for the purpose of showing that contrary to the efforts of some that the USDA is not on the job, the facts of the matter say that for the first time since 1992, the USDA is on the job. Now, my questions have to do not so much directed towards Secretary Veneman as to ask why isn't the FDA here testifying today? We didn't ask them to. 
We just didn't request that they be here today. We have a full hearing, as you can see, with three panels, and we couldn't get everybody uh, here. And we well, thought this would be. The reason I asked the question is the only way by which science has established that this disease is communicable from cow to cow is by virtue of the feedstocks. Now, it's clear from the evidence, which I'd have been happy to share with anybody, it's public record, it's on the APHIS website, it seems to me that our challenge really is over at FDA, not at USDA. They're act USDA is actually doing something for the first time in a decade. I mean, this administration actually got out of their chairs and have done something. So I would, I would ask, you know, we ought to have a hearing about FDA, not about USDA's efforts. Yeah, let me just say to the gentleman, I mean, we can do this at a subcommittee level, but it was a joint decision between the Ag Committee and this committee that we focus the attention on the expanded surveillance system, not on the FDA regs. Well, I, I appreciate that, Mr. Chairman. I'd, before I yield back my time, I just want to make sure that the facts get in the record that the USDA has, at least on a comparative basis, done upwards of ten times what the previous administration ever did. I yield back. Thank you. Mr. Van Hollen. Uh, thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Madam Secretary and gentlemen, for your, your testimony. Uh, and I think we all agree that our overall objective is to make sure that the consumer has justified confidence uh, in our food safe, uh, in food safety. I, I'm just trying to get a better idea of exactly how all this, this works. And since I only have five minutes, if you could give me as brief a response a, as possible. Uh, first, my understanding from your testimony, number one, is there's no requirement that anybody report a, a downer animal. Is that right? You, you don't, there's no requirement that be reported? That is correct. Okay. And there's no requirement that that be, that that animal be tested. Is that right? Isn't that right? That is okay. correct. So um, it's a, uh, that, with, the testing is, the testing is a voluntary program entirely. I, I would just um, add one minor correction to what I said before. There is a requirement to test anti-mortem condemned animals at slaughter. At slaughter, okay, but but not not uh, but there's no requirement to test every obviously every downer animal, at right? That's that's at, what your test. That's there the is test. at slaughter, but not elsewhere. Okay, and so that's a voluntary elsewhere, not at slaughter, but elsewhere. That's a voluntary requirement. It is indeed, and okay. it, and our initial so, numbers would suggest that we're getting very good voluntary cooperation right. in support of that program. But, but, I mean, to the extent that it's voluntary, it is still not a random sample. Isn't that right? Um, we arrive at a, a randomness by ensuring that we are getting collection of samples from all of the collection sites, whether they be animals at slaughter, renders, salvage plants, on the farm, uh, diagnostic laboratories. And we ensure that we have some randomness injected by ensuring that we are getting animals in appropriate numbers from all the different categories of animals that we want to test. Those animals that are exhibiting central nervous system disorders, those animals that are non-ambulatory, those animals that, uh, that are dead. And, and as Secretary Veneman has testified, we are encouraged by the first month's results and with the preliminary information, it would suggest that we are getting that random, randomness uh, inserted through good collection at all of the different sites and a good representation of the different categories of animals that we want to test. All right, let me ask you this. Is there a requirement that um, a, a downer animal uh, be tested before it enters the non-cattle animal food supply? I, I'm sorry, I didn't hear that before. In other words, is, it, does, is there a requirement that a, a, a downer cattle be tested before it can enter the non-cattle food supply, in other words, in, into, the, into poultry food or anything like that? No, there is not. Okay. And again, the purpose of surveillance testing is not to ensure that uh, an infected animal doesn't go into the feed supply. That's why we have a feed ban in place. The purpose of the testing is to determine prevalence right. of the But disease. getting back to Mr. Tierney's point, which as of now, the FDA has not uh, put, in, put into place a ban on the poultry litter issue. I wanted just to explore the question about whether or not you could have the disease spread through, uh, uh, you know, from a downer cattle into the uh, non-cattle food supply. So my, my, your, my understanding of your testimony is that there is absolutely no requirement that before uh, that animal be rendered and go into the non-cattle food supply that it be tested. Is that right? Our goal is to test all non-ambulatory animals. So I, to the I extent understand. that animals going into the feed supply 
go to renderers and salvage plants and other locations, in fact, they would be subject uh, to testing. And as I mentioned, we are getting good voluntary uh, cooperation from the renderers and the salvage plants, those locations that are producing uh, meat and bone meal for the feed supply. So, in fact, I would suggest that, that we are testing those animals. All right. let, let me add, those that are tested, is there, there, there's no requirement, as I understand it, that you hold the, the, hold the animal, the results, before it's distributed to the non-cattle food supply, before you get the results of the test. Is that correct? It makes good business sense for a renderer not to put a carcass into the feed supply until there is Let me just add, test results. But there's available. no requirement that you wait for the results of the test. No is that requirement, right? but in fact, um, almost all of the renderers are in fact holding that. Should any of those samples come back positive and the carcass not held, there is a mechanism through FDA to recall that feed. But, but it, wouldn't it make sense that rather than having to trace it after the fact, wherever it may have been disseminated, that we wait and hold it until we have the results of the test? Wouldn't that make, do you believe that would make sense as a policy? And, and in fact, that's what's happening in the majority of situations. But it's not, but, but Time of the gentleman why not expired. make it a requirement? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Time of the gentleman has expired. The uh, uh, gentleman from Kansas, Mr. Moran, another of our subcommittee chairs, is recognized for five Mr. minutes. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Thank uh, Mr. Davis and the ranking members as well. Uh, Madam Secretary, if um, beef consumption, which I assume measures uh, uh, consumer confidence in a strong cattle market, are any indications of uh, your efforts, uh, the Department's efforts, uh, in regard to addressing this issue, uh, by those standards, uh, I would like to comment that I think uh, USDA has done an exceptional job uh, in your response. Uh, we have uh, weathered this storm uh, much better than I think many anticipated. Uh, and I think uh, USDA's uh, reaction, involvement, uh, full engagement uh, has a lot to do with that. So I thank you for those efforts. Um, release of information about inconclusive tests uh, is a significant issue. Uh, and I would only again comment uh, upon uh, Dr. Collins' comments, which I think uh, USDA would be in a no-win position on this issue. Uh, if you don't release information, we'll be complaining that uh, there's inside information and the market is being manipulated. And if you do release the information, uh, we're going to complain that there's false positives. Uh, I do think that uh, the gentlewoman from South Dakota raises an, an interesting point about the amount of information that uh, could be helpful. And I think that's an issue that USDA ought to uh, review. False positives are important because they do affect the market, and I think USDA recognizes that. I remember when you announced uh, your decision in regard to 100 percent testing. One of the reasons that you were reluctant to support 100 percent testing was the concern about false positives. So I think that's the issue or an issue that uh, I would be delighted if USDA continues to, to monitor, tries to find ways to improve. And in that regard, I would ask you if there is any significant differences in the tests uh, and that are available to test for BSC, uh, any significant difference in the results as far as false positives? Is there a, a, another test that is likely to have fewer false positives per, but provide the same level of confidence in the results? Um, let me, let me uh, ask Dr. DeHaven to uh, review that because it is the APHIS scientists, as I indicated before, who are reviewing the various rapid tests as we, as we call them. Thank you, Madam Secretary. And indeed, one of the things that we look at as part of our licensing and permitting processes for these tests, as well as the field validation, is the potential for false positive results. Uh, again, I would point to the, the, the statistics thus far with uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 17,000 animals that have been sampled and, and uh, most of them tested at this point and, and so far two inconclusives. If my math is right, that comes up with a false positive rate so far of 0.012 percent, a very small percentage. Um, I, I don't have um, at my disposal presently what the published data may be with regard to false positives on some of the other tests. I would just assure you that we would not license or permit a test, uh, approve it through field validation unless we felt that we were getting acceptable results. So we do have a, a very rigorous quality control process in place that ensures that we are not uh, allowing tests to be used that don't have 
appropriate accuracy and sensitivity. I assume, Doctor, that you would confirm that you have and will continue to take every effort possible to reduce the number of false positives, uh, even if that means a, a different test, a uh, different procedure. Absolutely. Uh, and it, one of the questions raised about additional information uh, is related to Canadian cattle. Uh, and I'm interested in knowing if there is any basis for any reason to believe that cattle in the United States that originate from Canada uh, are any more likely to test positive for BSE uh, than a non-Canadian cow? I mean, and my question really is, have, have, have those cattle gone through the same, uh, the same rules and regulations, the same criteria in place in Canada in the same time frame, the same implementation, so that that supply uh, from Canada versus uh, a, a U.S. born, bred, raised cow, that there's no difference. I think you're exactly right. I think it's important to point out that Canada did implement the feed ban the same year, basically the same time the U.S. Ha did, that we worked over the years very closely with Canada in terms of all of the control measures for um, BSE, we've had very consistent programs. We've continued to work with them very closely as they had their find on May 20th of 2003 and we had our find on uh, December 23rd of 2003. Um, we continue to have constant dialogue in, at our technical levels to ensure that the regulations are as close as possible in terms of the, the actions that are being taken and that we share the science that we have. And, uh, we used, as you know, when we made the determination in um, December to appoint an international review panel, that was essentially the same panel that had looked at the Canadian situation. We thought that was important because they'd looked at the North American situation um, post the May 20th find. So um, we believe there is a very close correlation in terms of the kinds of actions that have been taken to protect the North American beef supply between the U.S. and Canada. Time of the gentleman has expired. The gentleman from North Dakota, Mr. Pomeroy. Madam Secretary, the last time we had a chance to visit it was regarding that May 20th Washington Post story regarding imports allowed in from Canada, contrary to the position that you had earlier announced in what would be allowed. Um, specifically, really took a litigation against a proposed rule by RCAF to bring to the fore the fact that certain imports and import certificates were allowed by the U.S. Department of Agriculture contrary to your own stated position. Uh, this was acknowledged by you in our meeting, and uh, we have a standing request for in such information as you might bring us in terms of what are you doing about it. I mean, I thought this really might be a situation where heads would roll, because literally all of the testing, all of the things we've been talking about regarding U.S. supply are undercut if you are allowing imports in from Canada uh, that are contrary to what you said should be allowed in. Uh, what is the status of your follow-up on the import issue? Um, Congressman, um, we have, uh, as you know, based upon the, the lawsuit that you referenced, um, uh, entered into an agreement that g goes back to the import permits that were permitted as of the August announcement. Um, I can let Dr. DeHaven explain this more completely, but APHIS had made the decision um, to permit additional products that were within the range of those products that were announced in August. Um, I, then in April, there was a decision made um, in APHIS to allow, based upon some discussions with Canada, to allow bone and beef. That should not have, that decision should not have been made. Um, and so as a result of the court action, all of that was pulled back. I will tell you that no product entered the United States that did not have a valid permit. No product entered the United States that was not consistent with the kinds of product that was permitted into the United States under the permits. Um, uh, and I think there one, were Madam a number... I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, but time is so short. Uh, I believe that permits were issued specifically on items like ground beef or processed beef products. And this was uh, perhaps coming from plants that were, were otherwise boxed beef products might have been permitted. But the issue is inspection was completely impossible. And basically, without U.S. inspectors at these Canadian plants, we were just left to their good word, which is why you didn't allow that within the range of imports you initially allowed. 
And so I'm not sure that it is a correct statement that product didn't come in under imports, uh, uh, permits, uh, that were inconsistent with what you had announced would be allowed in. Well, uh, what I'm wondering is, because you have within APHIS people allowing decisions contrary to your decision, what have you done about making sure that doesn't happen again? Well, I think that's a fair question. We've, we've, we've indicated with both Under Secretary Hawks as well as Dr. DeHaven and all of his folks that um, these decisions should not have been made um, particularly the, the bone-in decision and that um, Dr. DeHaven has ensured me that he has taken actions to ensure that this type of action would not happen again. What is the status of the pending rule on live cattle imports from Canada? Um, as you know, that rule was initially proposed last fall. It was proposed before we had the find of BSE in our country. Uh, we closed, initially closed the, the uh, comment rule as scheduled, then reopened it. Uh, because of the wide range of comments that we received in response to that rule, uh, it is taking longer than we had originally anticipated to finalize that rule. It is still in the review process within USDA, um, reviewing the comments that, got, that came in uh, during both comment periods. Um, and um, I can't at this point tell you, give you an exact time as to when we might be uh, issuing a, a rule with regard to the Canadian product. It's my own observation that for all of the discussion this morning about the efforts, many of them laudable by USDA to improve testing and surveillance of the U.S. product, uh, allowing Canadian imports in would seem to me to undercut consumer confidence in the beef products without a conclusive determination that equivalent steps are made in Canada. In addition, as we have discussed earlier, I believe that allowing imports in before we have gained these vital export markets back for our ranchers does not make good sense and that it is up to the United States to gain its export markets back based on what we have done. It's up to Canada to gain its export markets back based on what they have done. And if we allow imports before gaining our markets back, it seems to me that you and the trade representative will have to carry the burden of not just our case, but making Canada's case as we try to win these markets back. Thank you. I yield back. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Duncan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I apologize. I've been at other meetings, but I've, I've, uh, Ms. Veneman, maybe you've already discussed this. Uh, but I was a little surprised a, a, a while uh, ago when I uh, heard you testify and you said there had been, I, I mean, I don't know as much about this as a lot of people, uh, as most people here. Uh, and I was surprised when you said uh, there had been 180,000 cases uh, discovered since 1986 and that seemed like an awfully big number to me. I, I didn't know that there was that much of it. Uh, uh, and what I'm wondering about, you, you mentioned in your testimony all of these things that are being done. Uh, is it, all these things we're doing, is that leading to the discovery of more cases or are we seeing some progress? Are the numbers, numbers of cases going down? Were they much higher in the late 80s and early and mid 90s and now they're going down? You may have already discussed that, but I've had to be in and out. That is exactly the case. And I'll, let me just make a few comments and I can have Dr. DeHaven, who's the expert, give you the actual numbers. but. The, it is important to recognize that's 180,000 cases worldwide. Right. Um, this includes all of the cases in the UK. The UK by far, I think, has more than 90% of the cases oh. worldwide. So this was a concentrated disease for the most part. Um, and once it was discovered that ruminant to ruminant feeding was the big issue, uh, you then saw cases peak and begin to come back down. Uh, and so I think that um, um, while we can recognize the number of cases worldwide, the peak certainly ha was, as you say, during I think the early 90s when we saw the most number of cases. But I don't know whether you want to. Um, the Secretary is absolutely right. Um, there have been somewhere in the neighborhood of 187,000 cases worldwide. The vast majority have been in. Uh, in Europe, and most notably, uh, most of them have been in the UK. Um, and that goes to the fact that while the disease may have originated there, um, they had unknowingly, because we didn't know much about the disease at that point, had widespread uh, problem before it was discovered. Uh, um, 
how widespread and, and how the disease was spread. So while they have instituted very effective measures since then, they didn't institute, didn't know to institute those measures early on. Many of the measures that they took, of course, that are now showing reward, and in fact the numbers of cases that they're finding now is dramatically less than what they were finding uh, back in the mid-90s, would suggest that those measures have been effective. And of course, we're applying many of those same measures um, here in the United States and, and elsewhere in North America. So uh, I think the danger is in terms of equating the European experience with the North American experience. And in fact, they are very much different. Our level of exposure has been much less. We instituted protective measures simply because we had some of the benefit of the European experience, but we instituted some of those safeguards m much earlier on in the process, so the, the level of exposure uh, in the United States has never been what it was in many of the European countries. Uh, so obviously we should have a, a overall BSE program tailored to our experience and our situation as opposed to the European situation. What, what percentage of our beef do we import from other countries, roughly? Oh, let's see, we, we produce about 25 billion pounds. We import about three billion, three and a half billion pounds this year. So roughly, what's that, about 10 percent or so? Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much, and I certainly am pleased that you're making such uh, good progress. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Rupert. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Secretary Veneman, uh, one of the major challenges in the surveillance program is reaching cattle at the highest risk of having mad cow disease, and those cattle with signs of central service nervous system damage. Now, some of these animals are condemned at slaughter. Others are killed at the plant and sent to state labs for rabies testing. In both cases, past and current USDA policy is for all such animals to be tested for BSE. Now, the Inspector General found that because of several operational weak weaknesses, cattle condemned to slaughter for CNS symptoms were not always tested, and brain samples from cattle testing negative or rabies were not always submitted to BSE for testing. Uh, the, those weaknesses, by the way, include insufficient monitoring of slaughter data, uh, the lack of effective coordination, and lack of formalized agreements with non-federal laboratories engaged in rabies testing. The, the Inspector General reports that the problems, uh, the problems testing high-risk cattle still exist under the expanded program in effect after June 1 of this year. Now, this, this spring, when a single suspect cow was not tested for mad cow disease in Texas, there were national headlines. But the Inspector General found that in fiscal year 2004, 17 adult cattle with central nervous system signs were, were not tested. Nearly 200 such cattle have been missed over the last three years. And five state laboratories visited by the Inspector General sent only 16% of rabies negative samples for mad cow testing. And one state lab official told the inspector general that he or she didn't know it was possible to send samples for mad cow testing. Questions. First, how can you explain USDA's failure to date to coordinate the testing of this group of cattle that is so important for surveillance? And second, will you be willing to report a quarterly basis progress in testing these high risk cattle, including the total number of condemned cattle and the number of those tested for mad cow disease and the total number of rabies negative samples and the number of these tested for mad cow disease. Um, thank you, Congressman. Let me just say that, that with the new surveillance program, we are targeting the highest risk cattle. And I think that our initial results that we've seen for the first month indicate that we are getting a good, a very good cross sampling from um, the various sites, whether it's on-farm slaughter plants, renderers, um, public health labs, veterinary diagnostic labs, salvage plants, or stockyards. Um, understanding the issue you talk about with CNS, I think there are two issues. One is um, there are a number of cattle that weren't tested because they were under the age and simply APHIS did not test them uh, as the underage CNS cattle. After the incident in Texas that you talked about, USDA, when this was brought to light, USDA changed its policy. Both FSIS and APHIS put out a directive saying that all CNS 
cattle, CN cattle with CNS signs would be tested regardless of age. We've taken any discretion out of the system, any subjectivity. In addition, we announced that all anti-mortem condemned cattle at slaughter plants, except for veal calves that don't show CNS, would also be tested. So we have attempted to take some of the issues that were raised, um, both with the, cat the Texas situation as well as in the IG report, and address that directly with these new directives. Um, so I think we've also, I think the other issues that you bring up from the IG report, we're working very closely on the data issues. We've gotten our um, uh, CIO involved. We know that there are still um, data collection issues that we need to improve upon, but the, the, we're working closely with both the IG and with the CIO. How about, how about the issue of, of the quarterly testing? I mean, we, we all need accountability. We need a system. It's, it's, it's a I system that's in place. I, I, I couldn't agree with you more that we need accountability. I, I'm, I'm not ready to commit today on a quarterly system, but we will report as, mu as much as we can on a periodic basis. We are reporting on our website how many cattle are tested every week, and that's updated on a weekly basis. Um, so as of, I, I'm not sure you were here when I indicated that as of today, since June 1st, we've tested over 17,000 animals. What, what's your concern about the quarterly testing? It's just too, too voluminous, uh, or no? I, I, I mean, it may very well work. I just simply am. I see, my red light is on. Uh, Mr. Chairman's going to get me out. So, <laughs> you follow, if, follow up with any questions. We're going to keep the record open. That's fine. Uh, so, sure. uh, I'm pleased to recognize this time the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Burns. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I want to thank both chairmen for holding the joint hearing. I appreciate uh, USDA's response in this. I want to first join my colleagues in saying thank you to USDA. I think you've handled this challenge quite well uh, as a cattle producer and recognizing the potential threats uh, where we could uh, hardly have done better given the challenges in December. Certainly, I want to also say I have some concerns about false positives. We've, we've discussed that, I think, at length. Uh, it certainly generates market concerns and some volatility. Uh, certainly, the, the solution, I think, is the elimination of false positives. And I'm glad to hear your, your comments on that. We'll work toward that goal. I want to focus my question really on one issue, and that's testing versus animal ID. And maybe the uh, effectiveness and the efficiency and the efficacy of uh, our testing program as a method of ensuring a healthy and safe beef supply vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, an animal ID system, uh, whether we look at testing at slaughter, whether we look at uh, testing uh, on the farm, uh, targeted population testing, uh, give me your input on which of these approaches is preferable. Should they, uh, right now, there's certainly a dual track. We're looking at both of these things. But uh, uh, where are we getting the bang for our buck? Well, I, I think, Congressman, that they are these are two elements of our overall BSE response plan that are critical. Now, with regard to surveillance, um, we've had a lot of discussion of that today. We have s substantially increased our surveillance program to test at least 268,000 animals um, in the high-risk population, and we are well on track to achieving that goal. Um, I also announced on December 30th that we would accelerate the implementation of a national I animal identification system. I think it's important to recognize that an animal identification system is important for a much broader purpose than just BSE. Um, we really began looking at the animal identification system, a national system, because of the, the scare that we had with foot and mouth disease back um, in the early days of this administration. Fortunately for the United States and for our cattle producers, that didn't come to this country, but we certainly saw the devastation that was done in Europe as a result of that disease. One of the key elements in a disease that spreads quickly, like foot and mouth disease, is the ability to quickly trace back because that disease spread so quickly, and you have to know where the cattle have been. It's also important to be able to trace back when you have a BSE positive cow, but it's not because the disease is going to spread if you don't trace it back immediately. So there's, there's two different 
kinds of tracks that you would be using animal ID for. Um, and so as we encountered the BSE situation, we said we have been working on this system and we are, it is important to the overall ability to monitor and to um, respond to animal diseases to have a strong animal identification system. So we have um, a, um, a program in place. Uh, we are beginning to implement that program. We are working with all aspects of the industry to identify where animals are already identified, particularly to um, put together a system where we have, have a uniform system of premise identification, because you have to have a way of identifying those premises. So I would not see these as, as ex mutually exclusive programs. Uh, we think they're both necessary components of our, of, in the case of BSE, our overall d disease or BSE response, but in the case of, of the animal ID, it's an important program with regard to our overall animal disease and surveillance programs generally. As a, as a resource allocation, from a resource allocation perspective, can you share with us percentage of resources allocated to both of these uh, important projects? We have, we have um, obtained additional money for both of these projects. Um, we anticipate that for the surveillance program, that this is a year to 18 month program that um, depending upon what we find will determine the resources we need for the future. If we find no additional cases, I would anticipate that we would scale back to testing probably fewer animals. If we find additional cases, we may change our assumptions and, and have more testing. Um, on the animal identification, there are some additional some some initial initial uh, uh, costs that we have uh, we have included in our budget in terms of ramping up this program. I think there will be some ongoing costs, but hopefully it will not be um, long term um, extensive costs to the U.S. government. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're back. The gentleman from Arkansas, Mr. Ross. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and. Madam Secretary, thank you for joining us here today as, as ranking member of the Livestock and Horticulture Subcommittee of the Full Agriculture Committee. As you know, I've been very involved in, in all of this business and policy dealing with BSE and hearings not only up here, but the hearing we had in, in Houston as, as well. Uh, a few questions. Let me begin by uh, mentioning this to you. In the July 10th, fairly recent, uh, two, July 10th uh, New York Times article, uh, there was an article entitled U.S. Moving uh, to New Ban for Mad Cow, officials say. Uh, a federal official uh, was quoted as saying that in an effort to eradicate mad cow disease, they were moving toward a policy to ban the feeding of any farm animal to other farm animals. Uh, Madam Sec Secretary, is this based on sound science? And to follow up on that question, is there any hard evidence that prions are transmittable from beef to other species such as chicken? Um, as far as I know, there is no scientific evidence that I am aware of that would indicate that the disease is transmissible from ruminant to poultry. Um, I think that the article you're referring to was referencing the recent announcement of the advance notice of proposed rulemaking that was recently issued by HHS and USDA. Um, specifically requesting comment on a whole series of issues, including um, additional actions that may be taken with regard to feed. Um, and as you know, those actions would be proposed by the Food and Drug Administration under the Department of Health and Human Services. Um, so I think that um, I'm not familiar with the exact article you're talking about, but I believe that it would be in reference to the uh, ANPR that was announced on Friday. I would simply hope that whatever uh, policies are, are put in place are based on, on sound science. We absolutely believe that science has to control what we do um, with regard to animal disease and prevention in this country. We try to follow sound scientific principles in the decisions that we make. On another issue, uh, export markets. 
uh, are believed to be the only expandable market in the cattle industry. And as we know, they have not uh, reopened for the most part. Uh, currently, the Animal Plant and Health Inspection Service lists 58 countries, 58, whose borders have been closed to the import of U.S. beef. Uh, many uh, place blame on the U.S.'s lack of an animal ID program. Uh, what's your position uh, on the animal ID program? Does USDA still want to move with a voluntary program, or has U USDA finally realized to get these markets open back up, it's going to have to be a mandatory uh, animal ID program? Um, first, let me say that I I have not I have not heard that <laughs> countries are are keeping their borders closed because of lack of an animal ID system. Well, there's 58 countries, Madam Secretary, so why are they? Okay. Um, it is, has been the practice of the United States also when a country gets a case of BSE in its country that we close our borders to those countries. Other countries have responded to us the same way. We've worked very hard to open up our export markets. Um, we have succeeded in opening up the, the uh, Mexican market. Um, up to about 90 percent of the product they were previously importing. We have had a series of meetings with the Japanese about reopening the market. That is our number one export market. We've had discussions with the Koreans. We're, I, I might go back just for a moment. With regard to the Japanese, we are very encouraged by those discussions. We've had technical level discussions for the last two months. We'll have another technical discussion uh, later this month with a policy discussion to follow in August, and we're hopefully after that that we can come to some agreement under the terms by which the Japanese market may be opened. Um, likewise, we've had discussions with uh, countries like Korea. I've had discussions with China. Um, the Philippines has, has maintained that market is open. Some of the Central American countries are, are opening their markets back up. So the trade issue with regard to BSE has been a, a very important issue for us, and we've worked very hard. It was within four days after um, the announcement of the BSE cow in December that we announced that we were sending a team to Japan and Korea, and which we did between Christmas and New Year's. That's how important we looked at our export markets. And so we tried to uh, ensure that that has been a part of our uh, our overall BSE program as we've moved forward is to work with our trading partners to explain to them what we're doing, why we're doing it, the science behind it, um, and we're hopeful that we will see additional progress in opening up some of those markets soon. Time of the gentleman has expired. The gentleman from Minnesota, Mr. Gutnick, another of our subcommittee chairs. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I, want to, I want to thank the distinguished uh, panel, uh, clearly distinguished and, and very important public servants. Uh, Dr. Collins and Dr. DeHaven. I might just say, for the benefit of the members who are still here, Dr. DeHaven, uh, about a week after the uh, uh, discovery of the incident in the state of Washington, was kind enough to go on a radio show with me and uh, talk to uh, 12 radio stations at the same time in southern Minnesota and did a wonderful job of explaining the disease, where it comes from, how it's spread, and uh, what the USDA was doing. And I think largely, and I, I attached myself to the remarks by my colleague from Florida earlier, I think uh, the, the very prompt response by your department, Madam Sec Secretary, and, uh, and uh, the, basically the unstopping flow of information from people like uh, Dr. DeHaven, I think really pre prevented what could have been a, a catastrophe in the beef market. And uh, so my congratulations to you. Um, I, I'm going to use my few minutes here and more of a comment than a question to sort of compare how the USDA deals with these kinds of things relative to our friends over at FDA. Um, and uh, I will be somewhat critical of FDA because I think members, uh, both the, those who are left here, need to understand the difference uh, in, in the safety risk. As far as we know, and I don't want to downplay the seriousness of, of this malady because it is fatal. I mean, it, it is something we need to take very seriously. But I think you do have to compare the, the differences. We know, for example, that in any given year, on average, about 6,000 Americans will die of getting the wrong prescription drug while being kept in a hospital here in the United States, 6,000. Uh, when you compare that to the, the probability, and in fact, I think there was a Washington WAG who a couple of weeks ago said, and I'm not, I'm neither a statistician, a statistician or, or a particularly good in math, 
But um, I am told that, uh, that, that there was a WAG here in Washington who said recently that the likelihood of an American getting uh, BSE or mad cow disease is about the same as being struck by a bolt of lightning while you're holding the winning Powerball ticket. And, and I think, you know, I think this hearing is important, and I think all of the work that you're doing at USDA is important. But I think it's also important for us to put this in context. Because of the efforts not only of the USDA, but of, of the producers themselves, uh, I, I think we all believe, and I certainly am a very strong believer, that the food supply here in the United States is very safe and, uh, and that the beef supply is, uh, is the safest in the world. So um, I think we need to put that in, in, into perspective, that uh, while this hearing is important, what the USDA is doing is, is important, when you compare it to the safety of virtually everything else that we put into our mouths, it may well be that beef today is the absolute safest thing. And I'll just uh, end parenthetically with one last comment, and that is, uh, frankly, you are much safer taking drugs imported from Canada uh, than you are uh, just about anything else as well. And uh, so I will continue to uh, badger the good people over at the FDA. With that, I yield back the balance of my time. I thank the gentleman. The gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Hayes, also a subcommittee chairman, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to submit my opening statement for the record, if I might. In Without move objection. On. Thank you. Madam Secretary, thank you very much for being here today. And your folks being with you. I think it's very obvious that you all are aggressively working to deal with the issue of BSE. And I think the fact that the IG is here is very appropriate. Questions which is her purview have been raised and you all have clearly answered them. And we appreciate that. Um, also appreciate the way that you've been working with our trading partners, Japan and others, to make sure, of course, food safety is first, but above that, make sure that the markets are properly dealt with as it relates to this, and we appreciate that as well. Um, I'd like to identify myself with Mr. Putnam's remarks. Found a new steakhouse, and I'm not going to tell you where it is because you can't get in anymore. It used to be you call for reservation. Now you call and tell them you want to come, and they'll call you back and tell you if and when you can come. So that's a very clear indication that you all are doing a good job on the market issue. And Mr. Osi's raising the points of how you've aggressively pushed that forward is very important. Thursday, July the 22nd at 10 a.m., we will be holding an animal ID hearing to pick up on the issues that have been raised here today. That's another important part of the puzzle, and we want to move forward, making sure that the industry controls that and we take care of confidentiality and so on and so forth. My question for you, you've answered most everything today, is on the issue of animals on the farm, the new program collecting on-farm samples, can you talk a little bit about and explain what the USDA is doing to encourage producers to contact you when they have animals that need to be tested? And the samples taken since June the 1st when your program began, what percentage of these samples have come from the farm? Um, well, thank you for that question. I think um, it has been a question that's raised, been raised several times. As I indicated earlier, we do have preliminary data, and I think the data is encouraging. Um, first of all, what we're doing to collect from farms, we're, we're um, conducting an outreach program to reach as many producers as we possibly can to tell them of the importance of giving the samples to, to us so that we can determine the prevalence of this disease. One of the uh, heartening things is that the gentleman whose dairy um, the cow was the BSC cow was discovered on in Washington has agreed to do a public service announcement for us, telling other producers how important it is. And I think that's uh, that's a very important thing that's happened in terms of our outreach. It will help it will help tell other producers from a personal point of view. Uh, so we're we're working uh, to get as much outreach with producers, with with large animal veterinarians, with state veterinarians, state diagnostic laboratories that deal with producers, um, and to get the message out in every way that we can. I would say that from the initial numbers that we have, that we are getting a good representation from on farm. Um, 
the number that has been tested on farm, the percentage that's been tested on farm, these again, these are preliminary numbers from June, is 7.4 percent, but that does not really indicate the number of samples we're getting from farms because um, many of the samples that we're getting from rendering plants, which is about 30 percent, those that we're getting from salvage plants, which is about 40 percent of all samples, also come from on farm. The one of the from my understanding from my experts is that one of the most telling things about the samples that we're getting from on farm is the fact that about 70 percent of the samples we've gotten in the first month are animals that are being presented um, for sampling that are already dead. Those would be, that would be an indication that most of those are coming from on farm. So we believe, um, and the, the experts in my department believe that we have had a, a very good indication in the first month that the kinds of samples that we are getting are exactly the kind that we're targeting, those high-risk samples, and particularly those that are coming from farms. Thank you, ma'am. And in addition to the hearing on the 22nd, we will be having a trade show here showing different types of ways to track animal ID. Again, encourage our producers and ranchers to use the best and most efficient uh, way possible. Mr. Chairman, thank you. I yield back. I thank the gentleman. It's now my pleasure to recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Nagabauer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first of all, uh, Ms. Madam Secretary, I want to thank you for the fact that all through this process you have let science lead us through this and not politics. And I think that is very refreshing, quite honestly, in government. I think many times when we have uh, issues come up in this country, we let the, the, the politics drive it and not the science. And so I commend you for letting the science uh, drive this issue. Uh, I had a question first for, uh, for Dr. DeHaven. Uh, are you sampling behind the ramp, the rapid test to ensure that the, that the rapid test are producing uh, the, the appropriate results? In other words, to, for, for kind of a reliability check? We are certainly doing that um, in, in a, well in a number of ways. Let me let me clarify. Uh, first of all, we want to make sure that the 12 laboratories that we've approved to do this testing are, are doing a, a good job. So we have a uh, proficiency testing system where they would be provided known samples, samples with known results, and then having those 12 laboratories run those samples com comparing the results. So we've got a quality control system that will be in place for those laboratories. Uh, a certain number of the samples that are being tested at those laboratories have repeat tests um, at NVSL, our National Reference Laboratory. So we think that we've got a, a good quality control system in place. Thank you. Uh, Madam Secretary, it, when it comes to uh, SRM, I, I visited a packing plant not too long ago. In fact, it was my second visit there. And, and we were talking to s some of the folks that uh, work in those plants. and. Obviously, initially, uh, the policy was to go out and really look, identify anything that might be uh, at-risk material. Uh, but what I think some of them are saying is there's some science that would indicate that some of the material that's currently banned is, in fact, uh, there may be some science to say that that material could be uh, used in the future. Uh, kind of give me a, a feel, uh, again, talking about that concept of letting the science uh, lead the, the train here, where, where you are as far as reviewing uh, uh, the SREM policy and, and where we see that going forward? Um, Congressman, we have, we have um, when, we, when we implemented the SRM ban, which was part of the December 30th announcement and the um, January 12th Federal Register Notice Interim Final Rule, um, we looked at um, international standards. We looked at what other countries were doing. We looked at the best available science in determining what we should include as a specified risk material. Um, all indications are, I think, by the international review team that looked at the actions we had taken, uh, is that we made the appropriate decisions with regard to SRM. Um, all of these decisions, we are constantly looking at primarily because in the scheme of things, BSE is still a relatively new disease 
and there's a lot of science that we don't know. So we have to continually review the science as we know it to make sure the actions that, we're take are, that we are taking are appropriate with what is currently known about the science. And I know that we've talked about the downer uh, issue, but I, I do want to encourage you to, as you move forward, to give producers as many options as they can for animals that would be fall under the downer category, but it truly, in fact, uh, have, uh, you know, markability in, in the marketplace and not just salvage. And so uh, hopefully, uh, I, I think that's important to our producers, and particularly to our smaller producers. Uh, to, to a large producer, maybe uh, that's, that's not as uh, a big economic blow, but to some of our smaller producers, you know, losing an animal here and losing an animal there that, uh, for whatever reason, fall in that category uh, yeah, it causes some economic problems for them. Uh, you touched briefly on, on Japan, and I know that the Japanese were in uh, Colorado, I believe, with you uh, last week or been there a couple of weeks. Uh, you, you said you were encouraged. I, we, we're we're kind of going through a two- or three-step process. Could you just elaborate briefly on that and, and, and where, what kind of timeline you think we, we might be on with the Japanese? Um, as I indicated, we, we first um, started meeting with the Japanese within the first week after BSU was discovered in this country because it is our most important beef export market. Um, this has been a difficult discussion with the Japanese primarily because they had an outbreak just two years ago of BSE in their own country. And they've had to deal with a huge drop in consumer confidence in their country, something we didn't experience as you know, in our own country. Um, we had several sets of meetings. We had the Japanese here, and it was clear that we weren't making progress. And so um, we worked with an interagency process within the Japanese government and set up a series of technical um, meetings where a, a number of issues would be discussed. And the first one of those was held in Japan in May was followed by this meeting you reference in Colorado in June, followed by another one scheduled for Japan in July. That will be followed then by a policy level meeting, we believe in August, after which time we're hopeful that the policy meeting will then come out with some parameters by which we can um, see some, some opening of the Japanese market. Again, I can't predict exactly what's going to happen, but I can tell you we've been very engaged in this process, very engaged with discussions with the Japanese, working closely with them throughout this process, uh, and we are hopeful that we'll see an opening of the Japanese market in, in the hopefully near future. Thank you. Time of the gentleman has expired. The gentleman from Nebraska, Mr. Osborne, is recognized for five minutes. <clears throat> Thank you. We're winding down here. I appreciate your patience and your endurance. Uh, it's been remarkable. Um, just a, an observation and maybe a question at, at the same time. Uh, you know, I've heard a lot from producers in my state that are concerned about the um, possible yo-yo effect on the markets of continued uh, suspected positive cases being reported. And uh, maybe I'm observing this, and I hope I am, that um, as time goes on, maybe the media will kind of back off on reporting, and, and unless we actually get a positive case, maybe this will settle down. Do you, do you hope that this is what's going to happen, or do you have any comment on that? Well, I think that, uh, Congressman, you are um, correct that this is something that has not, it's not a familiar situation for our country. And so as we've introduced this, this new system of these rapid tests and announced that because of market impacts, we would announce the inconclusives, um, that um, that would create a fair amount of media interest. I think that as if we in fact get additional inconclusives and this becomes more routine, that, the that you get an inconclusive and then you send it to N NVSL for testing, uh, that people will understand that this is the normal part of our surveillance process and it won't generate quite so much attention. But it's, it, it's, hard to, it's hard to project because we don't know how many inconclusives we may get. We don't know if we may get additional 
um, mm -hmm. actual positive animals. That's what this testing program is really all about, is to measure the prevalence of BSC that may or may not be um, in our cattle herd. And, and I might say that we're constantly also working with um, the CFTC in terms of these kinds of announcements because um, the market impacts are, are really what we are watching very closely and the CFTC has a very strong interest in that and so we consult with them regularly on these issues. Well, well, thank you, and I, um, I understand why you're reporting. <clears throat> I think it's probably the right way to go, and, but <clears throat> we do hear a lot about it. And um, one other question that somewhat um, dovetails with what Mr. Nagabar was asking about, and that's Japan. It's my understanding that uh, we're going to maybe ask an ind independent uh, international agency to examine our testing policy, and if, if they were... Um, in agreement that we're doing a good job, that maybe this would result in some uh, case before WTO if the borders aren't open? I mean, is this a, a rumor that I've heard that's not correct, or what? Um, I'm not exactly sure what you're referring to, but I would say that we have had our, um, our surveillance plan. We, we consulted with the OIE, the, that, the World Health Organization. Mm -hmm. We had it reviewed before we um, released it by our international review team. We thought that was a prudent thing to do because they had suggested this enhanced surveillance plan. And we had it reviewed by um, our um, Harvard risk assessment team that has been working with us on the overall risk assessment for BSC. We continue to work with international experts from all of these arenas. Um, and I believe we will continue to do so. I think it's very important to have that kind of, you know, international top-notch oversight into the decisions we're making because all of these programs that we're implementing are, are brand new. They're, we're trying to do the, the, the best possible job that we can, and so we try to get the best expertise from a scientific perspective that we possibly can. Um, so we have... We did have some discussions with regard to Japan about having the OIE look at our respective, our respective systems and give some advice, um, and that w that was one of the offers that we had mm -hmm. on the table. Okay, one one last thing, uh, very quickly. I, another thing I hear about a lot is opening uh, the borders with Canada. Maybe that's been asked previously, and I know this is related to BSE. But do you have any any comment you can make as to what process is going to be involved here? Well, again, this is, a, this is in the rulemaking process as we speak. Uh, we had a proposed rule that's um, the comment period closed initially on January 5th. We reopened the comment period on that because of the find of BSE in this country. Uh, that comment period closed in April. And because of the number of comments that we've received, um, we have... Um, can, we are still in the process of evaluating all of those comments. We, we received a lot of comments on that rule, and as you know, you have to review you know, the, all of the types of comments that you got when you receive a rule. Um, you know, we, we're reviewing the, the risk assessment and the cost-benefit analysis and all of those things that come along with a rulemaking process, and so um, at this point it's impossible for me to project when we might see that rule completed. Hey, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman for his questions. Madam Secretary, we thank you very much for giving us three hours of your time, and uh, Dr. DeHaven and Dr. Collins, too. Uh, we know that in addition to that time here, there's a lot of uh, uh, time to prepare for something like this, to handle so many diverse questions uh, so well. And we thank you very much. And I, I will tell you that for myself, I continue to feel that uh, the department is doing a good job assuring the country that its efforts continue to make the United States food supply the safest in the world. Thank you, Thank Madam you. Secretary. Let me just say uh, our committee, as you know, had concerns with the old BSE surveillance system and the lack of written protocol uh, in place for the discovery of BSE infected cow. But APHIS has recently provided the committee uh, with written protocols for the expanded BSE surveillance program. Uh, I'm encouraged that this written guidance is a step in the right direction for the program over the next 18 months. We look forward to continuing to work with you and 
you've recorded yourself well. Thank you very much for your Mr. time. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, if, if I might also join in thanking the Secretary for being here today. Uh, you've been here to answer a lot of diverse different questions over many hour period. I did write you a letter yesterday, and uh, while well, the letter asked you to be prepared to discuss some of the issues that we raised in, in it, uh, we really didn't have a full opportunity to do that, so I would like a, a written response. My major concern, is, which is yours as well, that we have a system that works, but I, I want it to be credible. And what I don't want is a presentation of, uh, of the issue in a way that cannot be sustained on a scientific basis, uh, given, given, the, uh, uh, given the way the whole thing is uh, uh, structured and the assumptions upon it, uh, which it's based. So we uh, hope to continue to working with you on, on, this, uh, on this effort. Thank you. The committee will take a two-minute recess while we bring our next uh, panel forward. Ms. Vaughn. We now move to our next panel. Uh, joining us on the second panel is the Honorable Phyllis Fong, the Inspector General for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Ms. Fong's testimony will address the Office of Inspector General's audits of USDA's previous surveillance program and its subsequent expanded surveillance plan. Uh, Marlene Evans, the Deputy Assistant Inspector General for Audit, and Mark Woods, the Assistant Inspector General for Investigations, accompany Ms. Fong to answer questions posed by members. As you know, it's our policy to swear in members. If you'd rise with me and raise your right hand. Solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you very much. Um, your entire statement is in the record, and as you know, it's been it and much else has been released and read by members. So if you could keep it within five minutes, we'll try to move as quickly as we can. Uh, thank you very much for being with us. Turn the microphone on help, sir. Thank you very much, Chairman Davis and Chairman Goodlatte and ranking members Waxman and Stenholm for the opportunity to, to testify this morning. As you mentioned, accompanying me today are Mark Woods, who's in charge of our investigations program, and Marlene Evans, who has led the audit review for our office. The possible presence of BSE in the American herd is a matter of great concern and interest to all of us because of its potential impact on animal and human health, food safety, the economy, and international trade. We recognize that USDA has significant responsibilities in this area and a long history of involvement in animal health and food safety initiatives. With the discovery of the Canadian BSE positive cow last year and the Washington State cow this year, USDA has faced an enormous challenge to implement an effective surveillance program to determine whether and to what degree BSE may be present in the US herd. This effort has been complicated by the size and the geographical dispersion of the herd, the short time frames involved, and the complexity of the effort involving federal, state, local, and private entities. Our objectives in initiating investigative and audit work have been very simply to take an impartial look at the program as designed, as well as specific situations that have arisen, to determine the facts and to make constructive recommendations early in the process to assist USDA as it moves forward in implementing its program. Our work, by definition, presents a snapshot of the program at specific points in time. It is not intended to detract from the Department's ongoing efforts to continually refine and improve the program. On the contrary, we are encouraged by the commitment of the Secretary and the Department to address many of the issues that we have raised. Much has been accomplished by USDA since last December. We have received excellent cooperation from numerous USDA officials and APHIS and FSIS staff. We also appreciate the oversight and leadership that your committees are bringing to this issue, and we look forward to working with you as we collaborate and move forward. I want to briefly highlight some of our key findings, um, particularly on the Washington State investigation, which is of great interest to a number of people. Our first investigation concerned the identification and status of the cow slaughtered last December in Washington State, which eventually tested positive for BSE. We looked at allegations that the cow was in fact a healthy ambulatory cow rather than a downer as described publicly by USDA officials. And we looked at allegations that the US vet who examined the cow subsequently falsified inspection records under duress. 
Our investigation found no instances where USDA personnel knowingly conveyed false or misleading information or engaged in intentional misconduct. We discovered no evidence that USDA personnel on site at the facility falsified any records pertaining to the condition of the cow at the time of its inspection. The VMO on site who examined the cow found that it was non-ambulatory at the time it was presented for anti-mortem inspection. The plant owner also acknowledged the cow was non-ambulatory. Sworn statements provided by others who saw the cow that day did not contradict this evidence and contained no claims that the cow was ever ambulatory at that facility. And finally, traceback evidence established by Canada and USDA does not support the allegation that the cow had a white hide, as was originally um, alleged by the former employee of that meat processing plant. We also did an investigation of the Texas situation, which is summarized in my written statement, so I won't um, summarize that today. The reason we highlight these conclusions is because they illustrate some of the difficulties USDA faces in implementing an effective program. We've also done an audit, as you are well aware, um, that's been discussed in quite a lot of detail this morning. And I just want to emphasize that uh, our report, as you know, is in draft. The department has 30 days in which to respond. Our normal process is to take the department's responses and to address them and to incorporate them as appropriate within our own report, which we will then issue in final. Uh, we, we pointed out a number of areas where the department could tighten up its surveillance plan um, in a number of areas. Again, those were fully discussed this morning. And um, we are encouraged by the fact that the department is moving forward to deal with many of the issues we have raised and we are looking forward to getting their final response so that we can go ahead and um, implement this program at the department. So in conclusion, I want to thank you again for inviting us to testify, and we look forward to addressing your questions. Well, thank you very much. Um, let me start. How, does, how do you uh, plan to continue oversight of the expanded BSE surveillance program over the next 12 to 18 months? We have a number of initiatives underway. Uh, as was referenced this morning, we have initiated a review of the situation where beef was brought in over the Canadian border. Um, we've got that review. We have started about a week ago on that, and we anticipate it will take a little bit of time to nail that down. In addition, we have some audit work planned uh, to review the results of the implementation of the surveillance plan as it, as it moves forward, and also to look at how the department handles SRM materials um, in, in that particular program area. Um, your audit states that um, APHIS's current IT system is inadequate to support the expanded surveillance system. Can you speak specifically to APHIS's IT challenges and your recommendations? Uh, yes, thank you. Our audit looked at the current IT system and concluded that it was not adequate to support the expanded surveillance program and the, the expanded volume of samples that the department expects to gather. Um, we recommended or we, we, are, we found that APHIS needs to implement an integrated system that tracks samples from collection through testing through reporting of results and, and a, a network that integrates the, the um, the network of diagnostic testing labs. Currently, APHIS uses two databases. Uh, there's some issue about whether those two, data two databases are compatible, whether the data um, is consistent. And so we made recommendations to USDA to improve that system. Uh, we understand that the Office of the Chief Information Officer has been working very closely with APHIS and FSIS on this. We understand that they have a system in the design and implementation stage and testing, and we are actually quite encouraged by the progress that the department's making on that. Your audit states that APHIS can't easily identify, obtain, or test cattle in its high-risk population. Could you elaborate on this statement and your recommendations in terms of APHIS uh, being uh, able to remedy that situation? Um, yes, <laughs> that, that is a, a, a significant portion of our audit. It does address the issue of whether the targeted population can be adequately accessed through the testing program. And we 
had comments in a number of areas relating to high-risk cattle condemned for CNS symptoms, um, cattle who tested negative for rabies who should then be referred over for BSE testing, confusion regarding the, the whole definition of downers and, and the age on that. And uh, we made a number of recommendations to the department that it consider issuing more precise guidelines to deal with those issues and, and that it train FSIS and APHIS staff so that they could adequately implement those um, new guidelines. And also, could you elaborate <clears throat> on your concerns regarding the testing of rabies negative brain samples? Basically, our concern deal, dealt with the lack of formalized process for ensuring that tests that are sent to labs for rabies purposes, because rabies, um, cattle, cattle with rabies can exhibit similar symptoms to central nervous system disorder, it's important that a, cat, a cow whose rabies test is negative then be referred over for BSE testing so that that can be looked at. And we were concerned because there did not appear to be um, formal procedures that would ensure that those kinds of samples were referred from the state labs to the, to the appropriate labs for diagnostics. So basically, you ought to be testing for both. If it's negative on one, it just makes sense. Then you just uh, refer it right given, on. Given the symptoms yes. Uh, yes. on them. Thank you. Mr. Waxman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you very much for being here and for your report. I think you're playing a very important role with the department in uh, critiquing their proposal and uh, hopefully uh, your, your comments will be taken to heart by the department and improve their surveillance program. But their surveillance program seems to be based on an assumption that the, 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 the downer cows uh, are the highest risk and perhaps the only ones that we need to be worried about. A lot of that is, goes back to the first and only cow that we found with the um, mad cow disease. That was the cow in Washington. And there's been a controversy as to whether that, that, that cow was a downer cow or, or not. You testified that you didn't find any uh, knowing or intentional misrepresentation. But you do admit that there's some controversy over whether that cow was a downer cow or not, don't you? That was the allegation that was presented to us back in January, February, that the former employee of the meat uh, processing plant thought that the cow that was BSE positive was not a downer. Mm -hmm. So that has been one of the major issues that we have focused on. Mm -hmm. We have, through interviews of everyone that, that had contact with that cow during that time period, and interviews of that employee and interviews of the uh, USDA employees, we have not found any evidence that would indicate that at the time the cow was presented for inspection that it was ambulatory. At the time that it was presented for inspection, the USDA vet who was charged with the responsibility of making the professional call, in his professional judgment, determined that it was in fact a downer. And there has been all the other statements that we have obtained have not been inconsistent with that. Right. Well, that uh, highlights one particular moment in time. Right. But there right. are other witnesses who said at other times that the cow was ambulatory, that it didn't appear to be a, a downer cow. Now, if, if that is the reality, not perhaps at that moment when the inspector came in, then one would have to question whether it's correct to say that the only uh, cows that can get BSE are uh, downer cows if this wasn't, in fact, a downer cow. Uh, it's important because this assumption is driving everything else. Uh, I, I, um, I, I didn't really get a chance to pursue this with the secretary and regretted it because I was mainly questioning her about some of your criticisms of her, uh, her inspection plan itself. But, do you think that we ought to be basing all of our activities on this assumption that, that the only cows that can be uh, mad, infected with mad cow disease are downer cows? I think our audit report states that that is one of the concerns that we had with the surveillance plan as drafted. Mm -hmm. um, we understand the need to focus 
as a priority matter first on cows that are in the high risk group. We do not have a quarrel with that assumption. Uh, but we also wanted the department to consider the fact that the normal appearing adult population of cattle should also be looked at because we, we need to, um, the extrapolation from the high risk to the normal adult cattle population is a very difficult extrapolation to make. And so we, we've been involved in discussions on that issue. Well, I, 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 I'm glad that you are because it seemed like the department uh, made an assumption. They might have gotten the, got, found the cow out of luck rather than their system working the way it was supposed to work, but then made an assumption that this is, this is what, uh, what they ought to base their whole policy on. And it's, a, it's, it's an assumption that they then use to assure everyone that their system was working. And I'm not sure that it is working. And it sounds like you're not sure if, it's, if, this, if the plan is only to look at, uh, at uh, downer cows and, ass and assume that that's all we need for giving the American people and others the assurance, a reassurance about the food supply that that's sufficient. So I, uh, I, I want to point that out because this administration has had problems in the past of taking an assumption, even if, proof, even if there is evidence to the contrary, and staying with it, sometimes beyond any point where it makes sense. Uh, I, I thought your criticisms in detail uh, were very important. One of the points that the Secretary made to me was, well, those criticisms are not of her new plan, but the old plan. Uh, and I uh, wanted to just go through some of these points with you, because I, uh, a lot of what you listed did seem to apply to her present plan, not the old plan. Isn't that correct? We believe that some of the lessons that we have learned from implementation of the plan over time, old and new, applies to the implementation of the plan as, you, as we move forward. And so they raise legitimate issues to be discussed. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Chairman. Thank you for your time. Thank you, uh, Chairman Goodlatte. Yeah. Ms. Fong, thank you very much for participating today and for your extensive work in this area. We very much appreciate that and uh, your uh, associates uh, being here with you as well. Um, is it true that draft audits uh, can be modified significantly after a full consultation with the agency involved, in this case with, with APHIS, uh, as you exchange information and find that some of your assumptions may not be quite the same way when they have an opportunity to respond and give you some evidence of what they are indeed doing? The audit process does provide for that exchange of views and viewpoints. And as I pointed out in my testimony, when we receive the department's response, we will evaluate it. Um, it is conceivable that it will or could result in some change in our audit. Now, I, I just want to clarify that. Um, in terms of our audit work and the, f the factual basis for the audits, the data that we actually looked at when we went to the field establishments, it's unlikely that that data will change unless there is data that we just aren't, weren't aware of during sure, the course of the audit. Sure, but that's an opportunity for them to provide exactly. that before exactly. a, a final audit is, is delivered. And when was your draft delivered to the Secretary? July 1st. And is it appropriate for a draft audit to be considered publicly as the final conclusion of the Inspector General on an issue that's under discussion? In our view, our final audit is our final position. And when you made the draft available to members of uh, the Government Reform Committee and to members of uh, the Agriculture Committee, did you expect that it would be made public? When we transmitted it, we transmitted it to the committees with the understanding that it was um, essential to you in your oversight capacities and that you would use it um, in that light and with the appropriate safeguards. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to make that very clear that while we want to be very transparent in what we're doing, we also want to make sure that what is made public is something that has been carefully audited and uh, has the uh, full availability of uh, the evidence that might be provided by the department in their discussions with you. Now, to the substance of the issue, is a cow a downer for a month, a week, a day, or is the downer distinction drawn at the point that the USDA veterinarian inspects the cow and makes a professional judgment? That's a very difficult question. Um, and, and I am not a vet. 
uh, or an APHIS employee, so I, I hesitate to su substitute my judgment as to animal health. Um, I would say that it's important that the department have a clear definition of what it means by downer or non-ambulatory and ambulatory. Once that definition is established um, and implemented appropriately, then it's up to the individual vet who is charged with the responsibility of exercising his or her judgment to apply that definition in an appropriate way. Absolutely, but if a cow uh, has some, some uh, difficulties, it may well be able to walk some of the time uh, and maybe down some of the time as well. And if the, the cow is presented to the veterinarian in a down position, that is certainly a reasonable conclusion for the veterinarian to draw when they conclude that it was indeed a downed animal that they're examining. That is, in fact, the situation that happened with the Washington State cow. There was testimony that we had from um, witnesses that we interviewed that indicated the cow walked onto the trailer that morning but by the time the cow arrived at the slaughter facility, the cow was sternal, was, right. was lying down. And so the vet at that time called it a downer. That's not an inconsistent statement. Sure, absolutely. And it is also uh, very true that uh, the, the scientific evidence would point to uh, animals manifesting symptoms of uh, illness, either downed or ambulatory, would be the the animals for which they would pay their greatest attention to in their testing. Is that not correct? The, 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 the likelihood is far greater that that's where you might find BSE. And so far in the uh, thousands of cows that have been tested, uh, since the change in the rules, none have been found to have that uh, disease, thankfully. But it is also true that there could be some cattle in the larger population that might have this disease that are that are not showing uh, symptoms of being down, whether they're whether they're ambulatory part of the time and then downed or not. There could be some cows out there like that, but in terms of using the resources to find uh, the illness uh, that's involved here, it is it is true. I would assume, and I, I would like your opinion on this, that the principal focus should be on those animals that are most likely to manifest the disease with some testing, and it is indeed the case with the new regime, that some testing is taking place for uh, what is called the healthy animal population. That is the department's approach, and we do not have a quarrel with that in terms of priorities. Um, the only comment that we would have is that the department be very clear in what its priorities are and its goals, and that its, um, its plan clearly communicate to the public what it is trying to accomplish. We understand that, and they will certainly have an opportunity to respond uh, to your, your draft audit in that regard, and we, we certainly hope and expect that they will re respond to your, your points, which are well taken. Uh, at this time, uh, Mr. Davis, uh, we'll recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Stenholm, the ranking member of the Agriculture Committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> I want to follow on the last line, the, the primary purpose of, of all of our food safety and inspection service, all of our activities, is to make sure that the consumer has a wholesome, safe supply of food. Uh, that's the purpose of this hearing. You know, and I, I find it rather interesting that uh, in the headlines of the Washington Post uh, in the story today, the title says, USDA Mad Cow Detection Challenge report says animal wasn't a downer. That's not what your report said. Your report found no evidence of intentional falsification in either Washington Net or failure to test that one downer cow. That's what you said. Someone else read this. What they wanted to see in it was that there was possibility that it was or it wasn't. You have testified in answering the questions uh, very specifically that based on your investigation, the report as came from USDA was accurate. But there are differences of opinion, correct? I think that's correct. And you investigated the differences of opinion and found no evidence to corroborate those who had a different opinion than the inspector. Our, our investigation indicated that the inspector made the call at the time and there was no evidence that contradicted that. Um, I, I will say that investigation reports are not always easy to understand. They can be very technical, and it's, it's easy to be misled by some of the terminology. 
I, and I can <laughs> fully appreciate that, having dealt with this question myself yeah. for a few years. Uh, th there are those, and they, I don't question their intentions or their integrity or anything about those who have differences of opinion regarding our food safety and inspection service. Uh, but I think it is not helpful when we leak a report, whoever it did, and then come to a conclusion that is not substantiated by what the report said. Now, in the... In your testimony, you state that APHIS cannot easily identify, obtain, or test cattle in its high-risk population. Uh, Mr. Waxman, and I think not totally incorrectly, is suggesting that we, we perhaps need to look at other animals other than high-risk in order to be as absolutely certain as we need to be. And it's my understanding, based on the current procedure, that that's exactly what we are doing now. We're looking at a pretty broad-based number of samples so that the concerns raised by Mr. Waxman are now being met by the procedures. Is that your finding? The expanded surveillance plan as drafted by APHIS provides that APHIS will sample 20,000 cows from the normal appearing adult population. And we had some concern about um, how that sample was going to be handled and the statistical analysis underlying it. I think that through our conversations recently with APHIS and the department that this is an issue that both sides need to continue to talk about because it's, it's not an easy issue to address. But I, my sense of, the, of this is that the department understands that we, we do need to do some sampling in the normal population and so we need to work together to figure out the best way to do that. But, you know, as someone who warned about the problem that might be associated with banning downer animals, I'm tempted to want to agree with your assessment of the problems that have been associated with that policy. However, given the rate of testing among higher risk cattle that USDA seems to have achieved, what evidence do you now have to support that original assertion? Can you repeat the question? In your testimony, please? you state that APHIS cannot easily identify, obtain, or test cattle in its high risk population. One of the concerns that many of us had was the downer animal was, we, we wanted them to, con I did, I wanted them to continue to come into the slaughter plant, have a veterinarian determine whether or not that was a sick animal. If it was, it's out. If it's a broken leg process, that it would continue in. Uh, that was what we want. We, that, that has now been changed. You came to the same conclusion that because of that, it was creating a problem with the identifying the high risk population. Right. I said where I was attempting to agree with you, I wasn't. Uh, that's not the point today. That's that's being looked at, and in the interim uh, rule right. is being determined. The question is, uh, having, how given the rate of testing among the higher risk cattle that we're now achieving or seems to have achieved, what evidence do you have to support your original assertion that we had a problem in that area? We have not done any analysis as to the testing that has been done since June 1st. That is part of what we plan to do in the future in looking at the effectiveness of what the department has done and in responding to our recommendations. Thank you. Mr. Go ahead, Bob. Uh, it's my pleasure to recognize the gentleman from Kansas, Mr. Moran. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, just uh, perhaps a couple of follow-up questions to uh, questions that the IG has been answered. Let me make sure I understand the period of time that which your audit covers. And then the last, uh, uh, and a significant part of that, I think, is that none of that um, audit was conducted post um, the new surveillance uh, being implemented. Is that true? We completed our field work during the spring of 2004. We initiated the audit, I believe, in February, and we completed our field work through June. And, and the new surveillance was implemented, was announced in March, but implemented on June the 1st. Mm -hmm. So your, the conclusions uh, that uh, are drawn in your report are really based upon uh, events and therefore methodology policies that predate the new surveillance of June 1st? Our audit is based on, on our data analysis of data that was available prior to the June 1st implementation. Um, and then in response to uh, Mr. Stenholm's uh, inquiry about the downer, part of what you're indicating is that we need a clear definition of what a downer animal is. 
uh, and perhaps a time frame in which an animal becomes or remains a downer. Is that true? Yes. <laughs> and, uh, but you're also indicating that uh, if we exclude downer cattle from the uh, food supply system, we are limiting the ability to test the cattle that may be at most risk for BSE. Is that true? That is an issue that we have put on the table with the department. Um, the question is, if those animals are no longer going to the slaughterhouses, how will we, the department, be able to access them for sampling? And that, that is something that we believe needs to be looked at. Do you have any preliminary answer to that question? Uh, is, is the department doing anything to, to uh, have surveillance uh, test those animals? I am not aware of anything um, in particular. Now, that's not to say that that's not going on. It's just that we may not be aware of it at this time. And I guess that's my final point, is that much may change uh, as you have conversations with USDA, or, yes, with USDA, APHIS, uh, and you reach your final conclusions. Uh, we ought to again look at this report uh, to see what your final conclusions are. Is that accurate? That's right. good advice, I assume. Yeah, yes, it is. And we do plan to, uh, when we issue the report, to provide it to the committee for the record. Uh, thank you very much, Ms. Fong. I always find you a very impressive witness, and I thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, both committees, right? You supply it to both committees for the record. I'm sorry, I didn't hear You'll that. You'll supply it to both committees for the record. Absolutely, right? okay. yes. Uh, Mr. Kimmel. General Fong, I just want to thank you for your uh, testimony today and for the audit work that you have done on the old system. Uh, and we look forward to continuing to work with you and the department uh, as this new system uh, takes hold to make sure that uh, we continue to have a uh, safe food supply in this country. Thank you. Thank you. I thank Mr. you as well, Mr. Weissman. I, if I might, I had, I'd like to take another, another round to clarify some issues here. Um, the, our problem is we're expecting votes in a couple of minutes, and I want to get the next panel on. I think Mr. Well, I Goodlatte, what's your? I appreciate that, Mr. Chairman, but we don't have a lot of members here, and uh, I know that's. I think we could uh, take questions in writing and make sure that they are. Well, Mr. Uh, Chairman, I, I'd yeah, like to pursue less than five minutes of questions, if I might, and I'll. Well, I, I think, I mean, possible. we're really eager, uh, Mr. Waxman, we've tried to indulge everybody today, and we've been here, this hearing started at, at 10. Um, what I'd like to do at this point is to have you submit the questions in writing, and Ms. Funk, will you try to re respond to them and, and get back to him on that? I think that's appropriate. I'd like to move the last panel and get them in before the vote if we can. Otherwise, they could be stuck here for a uh, much longer period of time. So. Okay. Well, Mr. We, Chairman, I, yes. I regret that I can't have the opportunity to ask more questions, but I will submit them in writing. To that'd be to that'd be fine. If, if you had members here, we could have had them yield. But I, I just want to well, move I, this. I didn't this think I'd have to call some member to give me the courtesy of asking a few more questions. So the next time we'll do that, Mr. Chairman. All right. Thank you. Next step. Uh, you. no, you're dismissed. In fact, this looks like a time uh, with the vote coming on. Maybe we ought to recess. Uh, I mean. Mr. Chairman, since we're not going to have a chance to put on the next panel, may I have a few minutes to ask some questions, Ms. Fong? Ms. Fong, if, if that's okay with the... Uh, I think we're going to go to vote. You, you want to cut me off? Well, Henry... We now move to our next panel. I want to thank our witnesses for appearing today. Um, joining us in our third panel will be Dr. George Gray, the Executive Director of the Harvard Center for Risk Analysis, Dr. Peter Lurie, the Deputy Director of the Public Citizens Health Research Group, Mr. Jim Hodges, President of the American Meat Institute, and uh, Dr. Gary Weber, who's the Executive Director of the National Cattlemen's Beef Association. Uh, again, gentlemen, it's our uh, policy. We swear everybody in, so if you'd rise with me and raise your right hand. <laughs> uh, solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. 
Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Gray, why don't we thank you all for, for being with us and for your patience. It's been a long day uh, for those of you sitting out there. But why don't we start with you and we'll move straight on down. Uh, if you can keep it to five minutes, your entire testimony is in the record, and then we'll go ahead to, to uh, questions. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Davis, Mr. Goodlad, Mr. Waxman. Um, as I've just been introduced, I'm George Gray from the Harvard Center for Risk Analysis. You can learn more about our group by looking at our website, our mi mission, our research, and our funding. Um, my comments today are based on my research and experience as a scientist, a risk analyst, and a public health professional. They shouldn't be attributed to anyone else, including the Center for Risk Analysis or the Harvard School of Public Health. Um, I do want to recognize publicly the contribution of my colleague, Dr. Joshua T. Cohen, to the work upon which his testimony is based. Um, part of this testimony is based on a review of USDA's enhanced surveillance plan that we did for the department at the request of the department in March 2004, and that's attached to my testimony. I really want to make three main points today, and I'll try and do them uh, very quickly. The first one is surveillance provides us information that helps us to manage risk. It helps us to do this by understanding whether BSE is present in the U.S. cattle herd and how extensively it might have spread. We have to remember that it is not a public health measure. The U.S. government has already taken many steps to help reduce the risk of BSE to animals, primarily there through the feed controls that the FDA put in place in 1997, and to humans. And there, uh, some of the most important things have already been discussed today, the removal of high-risk materials from human food. So surveillance helps us determine if those measures have been successful, and they'll help us decide whether additional or even fewer measures are needed going forward. My second point is that USDA's focus on testing high-risk animals is the best way to monitor the population. Of course, the most accurate estimate of the number of animals with BSE in the United States could be developed if we tested every single animal. But much of the energy there would not be productively spent. And I do want to touch on some knowledge that we know from what's happened in the rest of the world about how high-risk this high-risk group is that we're talking about. Data from Europe, and here I'm going to talk about combining um, information across all of the European uh, Union and the data from their testing in 2002, 2003. But there, it tells us that the prevalence of BSE in the high-risk animals, the ones that we're, there's virtually the same definition that the USDA is using, the rate in those animals is about 25 times higher than the prevalence in apparently healthy animals over 30 months of age. So there is the potential for BSE in apparently healthy animals, and that's an important thing we have to recognize. However, in testing, this tells us that in Europe, they have to test, on average, about 1,300 high-risk animals to find one BSE case. They have to test over 33,000 apparently healthy animals. So if we want to find the cases, we should look where we know they are, and that's in the high-risk group. Now, Dr. Cohen and I have some concerns about the assumptions underlying the estimates of the sensitivity of the USDA plan. And we discussed those in some detail in our, um, in our memo that you can read. So I think that it is important to say that we're going to have to go back and reevaluate exactly what we learn from this system. But this surveillance plan is the best way to get a handle on what's happening in the United States <coughs> with BSE. So to summarize, I think that the USDA expanded surveillance plan will provide us useful knowledge for BSE risk management. It will help us to make better decisions. However, it's important to remember that protecting human and animal health depends on other measures which have already been taken or, in some cases, they've been proposed by government agencies. The expanded surveillance plan, as designed, it's a targeted and it's efficient and it'll provide us useful information. There will be challenges in interpreting and in communicating the results, but I'm confident that these challenges can be met. Thanks for the opportunity to address you, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Dr. Gray. Dr. Lurie, welcome. Thank you. Um, like Dr. Gray, I too am going to make three points. Um, the first is that um, the previous and indeed the now proposed surveillance system um, has never been able to detect BSE at the level claimed. It was never able to detect BSE at the level of one in a million adult cattle, and the now proposed one will not be able to do so at the level of one in 10 million cattle as claimed. The second is that although important to remove downer cattle and other high-risk cattle from the uh, from, from uh, human consumption, uh, the contribution in terms of reducing the overall risk of BSC exposure to human beings is only limited and not as high, I think, as has been implied by USDA. And finally, as the IG has very well documented, 
uh, the system has been characterized by inconsistent sampling of downer cattle and the still more risky CNS cattle, as well as we now learn the rabies negative cattle. And we don't think there's been adequate geographical distribution either. On the first point, the USDA has claimed on its surveillance website that it could, um, in the past, that it could uh, detect the disease should it uh, at, at a level of one or more cases per million in the adult population. And they now reiterate that with respect to one in 10 million um, at, uh, a, at the 95 percent confidence interval for the new expanded program. Both claims, and has been very clear today, rest on the false assumption that there are literally no cows likely to turn up positive in the normal appearing animal population. Dr. Gray has just said that that is not the case. The IG has said that that is not the case. And indeed, from what I can understand, uh, Dr. Veneman herself is now backing off from the claim of 1 in 10 million, and it's none too soon. It's certainly true that the risk for BSC is higher in the downer than in the non-downer cattle. There's no question about that. The question, though, is if literally all of the risk is located among the downer or other high-risk animals. In fact, 287 normal-appearing cattle tested positive for BSC in Europe in 2002. So although um, Dr. Collins, I believe his name was, says there's debate about the extent of the risk about, uh, among the, the lower-risk lower animals, one thing that there is no debate about is that the USDA's uh, assumption is absolutely false, i.e. that it is zero risk. Nobody endorses that position, yet that is precisely the assumption upon which the 1 in 10 million and 1 in 1 million previously estimates have been based. Let me draw your attention quickly to a graph that I've attached to my testimony and try and walk you through it. Um, the way this works is um, along what I would call the x-axis, the bottom part, um, you learn that if the risk of downer and high-risk animals is 500 times higher than that among normal appearing animals, most of the risk for BSC does in fact appear in the high-risk category, about 83% of all risk. However, if you, as you move to the left, lower and lower fractions of the total BSC risk are among the downer and high-risk animals. We based our estimates on the data from Europe where there is a 31-fold increased risk among the, among the higher-risk animals compared to the lower-risk ones, something similar to what Dr. Gray has done. In fact, if anything, we've been conservative in so doing. And what you, that arrow shows using the European data, which after all are the only data we can use because there are no comparable American data, that only 24 percent of the total risk is among the, uh, the higher-risk animals. There are two implications to this. The first I've already stated repeatedly, which is that the one in 10 million uh, uh, assurance is false. The second is that by removing downer cattle from consumption, again, a good move, uh, you've only had a limited impact upon the overall risk of US humans uh, for uh, contracting BSC. Um, I almost don't need to say much about the problems that have uh, been portrayed by the IG. Uh, with respect to the implementation of this program because I think that she's done a very good job of them. Um, but the, we ourselves have done a study back in 2001 in which we showed a 600-fold difference in the rates of uh, testing among dairy cattle for BSC from the highest state compared to the lowest state in terms of rates. So a truly massive variation uh, in terms of the rates of, of testing by state when they should be approximately equal. Much has been said about um, the case in Texas, I don't think I need to reiterate that, the case in Washington, all of these indicate that there are questions about the, the implementation of the program um, in addition to the way risk communication has occurred. In sum then, there is much about the design of USDA's expanded surveillance program that is praiseworthy. The focus on high-risk animals, not the exclusive focus, but the, over, the general focus on high-risk animals is a good thing, as is the greatly increased number of tests, the expansion of testing to include 20,000 normal appearing animals, and the approval of more rapid testing technologies. But the program has also been riddled with deficiencies in the risk communication and implementation spheres. After all, this is a program that we have heard is not random, has incorrectly estimated a one in 10 million risk, has incorrectly, uh, sorry, has, has only has, by, by removing the downer cattle, has only removed about 24% of the risk in the targeted population, has missed 55% of cattle with CNS symptoms, has missed 84% of those that are negative to rabies, and appears not to be geographically distributed. If the public and potential importers of U.S. cattle and cattle products are to be reassured, 
It can only be on the basis of accurate scientific information rather than the false or misleading information that has represented a significant portion of the USDA response to date. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lurie. Uh, Mr. Hodges, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A review, a review of some basic uh, facts is necessary in order to understand the purpose and adequacy of any BSC surveillance program. Erroneous pr comparisons have been drawn between the U.S. and Europe with respect to the risk of BSE and its animal health consequences. The facts show that the U.S. risk is many orders of magnitude lower than Europe's. More than 180,000 cases of BSE have been diagnosed in cattle since the disease was first discovered in the U.K. in 1986. At the height of the epidemic in 1992, more than 1,000 cases per week were being diagnosed, and that's only the diagnosed cases. Experts have estimated that between 3 and 4 million cases of BSE actually occurred, and that's compared to two cases of BSE in North America, both of which were determined to be of Canadian origin. Potential human exposure to the BSE infective agent in the U.S. is exceedingly small. The U.S. is not Europe. We will not experience the animal disease epidemic or the number of human illnesses that occurred in the UK because we took preventative steps to protect both human and animal health. Considerable debate has ensued regarding how best to protect the public. The first objective is to prevent the introduction and spread of the disease in the cattle population. To that end, firewalls have been constructed, as you've heard earlier today, to protect the U.S. cattle herd Import restrictions on countries that have BSE were first put in place in 1989. In 1990, the U.S. was the first country in the world to implement an animal disease surveillance program when the disease was not known to exist in this country. And a precautionary ruminant to ruminant feed ban was implemented in 1997 to prevent the amplif amplification and spread of the disease in our cattle herds. Those firewalls have been significantly strengthened in recent months. All slaughter facilities must now remove potentially infectious material or the so-called specified risk materials. Experts from around the world agree that removing SRM from the food supply is the most effective means to protect public health. An effective surveillance program is a necessary component of an effective animal disease prevention program, but it is not a food safety program. Testing cannot guarantee that BSE is not present in the animal, nor can test testing protect public health. All of the laboratory methods currently used can only detect the disease a maximum of six months prior to the clinical onset of the disease where visible signs of the disease can be observed. Testing young animals under 30 months of age is scientifically indefensible. In fact, one leading BSE expert said that testing young animals constitutes veterinary malpractice. Given the average age of clinical onset of the disease is four to seven years and the limits of testing methods, the USDA surveillance program is appropriately focused on the cattle population that is most likely to exhibit the disease. To illustrate as uh, Dr. Gray earlier did, data from Europe show that approximately one in four animals that show clinical signs of a central nervous system disorder test positive. In the emergency slaughter and fallen stock, or what we would term dead or downers, it's approximately 1,000. And for the older, normally pairing animals, approximately one in 30,000 test positive. Let me make clear, however, that the industry supports a robust animal disease surveillance program. If the disease is present in the U.S., we want to know it. It's a very important way that we can effectively determine if our BSE prevention measures are working properly. The appropriate level of animal disease surveillance is a matter of how much confidence you need or want in the data, or stated differently, how much sampling error are you willing to tolerate. At the projected sampling rate of approximately 270,000 animals in the high-risk population, we would be able to detect the disease if it exists in more than 1 in 10 million animals in the target population with a 99% confidence level. That's a high degree of statistical confidence that greatly exceeds world animal health 
standards. Critics of USDA's surveillance program have focused on a lack of random sampling, poor geographical distribution, and an inability to determine an accurate prevalence rate. These criticisms might be justified if US, USDA were collecting data for a peer-reviewed scientific journal article. But this is not an academic exercise. It's an ongoing animal disease surveillance program. The objective is to sample as many animals as possible in the cattle population that is most likely to exhibit the disease. The dead and downer category is estimated at approximately 440,000. USDA plans to sample in excess of 200,000 head or about one half of this high risk population. If BSE exists in a domestic herd, we will find it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Hodges. Dr. Weber, welcome. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here, and we appreciate this opportunity to share our perspectives with this uh, organization, this committee, this process, as we've <coughs> engaged in it many times in the past. And I think just to reiterate, rather than go through uh, redundancy, all of the things the United States has done since 1989, it's important, though, to reference that these steps were taken before we've ever had the disease, and we are the first country in the world to take that kind of an aggressive approach. I've enclosed a timeline in my testimony which clearly illustrates how different the United States has been, how proactive we've been in preventing BSE. And so from that perspective, we enter this discussion about surveillance from a position of being proactive. This program, as I said, began in 1989 and has been supported and expanded and analyzed by both Democratic and Republican administrations. And so we are in this mode now of analyzing a surveillance program that's built upon a long history of being aggressive and proactive. This expanded BSE surveillance program represents one recommended by an international review team, supported by the international animal health scientific community, supported by risk analysis experts, and we support it being developed and implemented fully Obviously, we had a case of BSE. It was of Canadian origin. And the International Review Team, in recognizing this, still suggested that let's expand the surveillance program to confirm our assumptions that have been made in previous risk ass assessments that the disease prevalence in the U.S. is very low. And indeed, as, as experts have determined, if it's present, we believe that the current feed restrictions, as they are being fully enforced, are in the process of eradicating the disease if it were present. So as others have said, we support this expanded testing program. There's been a lot of discussion about whether it is absolutely capable of determining this level of one in 10 million. But in the animal health arena, it's important to recognize that we are estimating the prevalence of a disease. That estimate will work its way into other risk assessments and analysis of whether additional measures need to be taken. It is just an estimate. It's not meant to be an absolute. And we support a process that can reach a desired level of, of surveillance that we can feel confident in. And we believe this program will do that. Under the current surveillance program, the USDA has established an outstanding network of approved laboratories that will contribute to the national BSE surveillance effort. It is important uh, to review that it's our understanding that these laboratories are using a rapid test uh, that is used in many countries. It's an automated system, the ones that are currently in place in the seven laboratories, and that it does have very high sensitivity that can produce a fairly high level of inconclusive test results that have to be proven by the gold standard whether or not they're uh, they're actually BSC or not, and that is the immunohistochemistry method. And we, again, support this process of looking at inconclusives. All of these samples are sent to our National Veterinary Services Laboratory in Ames, Iowa. And again, we support the transparent process that's underway here. The only issue we have with USDA and the laboratories is that we want to make sure that the laboratories are using the best quality assurance programs possible to ensure the quality of test results we don't want to miss any true inconclusives, but we also do not want to have a high number of, of such results that are reported simply an artifact of the normal variations of operation in the lab systems, because this does have an effect on our markets 
and, and on consumers. To date, uh, consumers remain completely confident in our system as evidenced by beef demand, and we want to continue that, and we believe we're building on a foundation that USDA has helped establish of that confidence. We want to continue doing that. The NCB has offered our support in ensuring the USDA has access to as many animals in the targeted risk population as possible. Data from this expanded surveillance program will be important for many reasons. Uh, these estimates will provide uh, data to our long-standing programs, the analysis of those, and I think it'll show that staying on the course that we've established since 1989 will continue to protect animal health. And it's important to note that public health is protected by the SRM removal practices, the removal of animals from the, uh, the, the down or dead disease population from the human food supply is an appropriate additional safeguard. The NCBA will continue to analyze the situation as, as the surveillance program works forward and determine what, if any additional science and risk-based measures are necessary. Thank you again for this opportunity to share our views with you and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Dr. Weber. Thank you all. Uh, we'll now start with questions, and um, please recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Waxman. There has been some confusion about uh, whether the cow in Washington State was a downer cow, and I tried to clarify this issue with the Inspector General from the uh, Department of Agriculture, but I uh, was not given the time to do so. And I wondered, Dr. Lurie, if maybe you could help set the record straight. Uh, the Inspector General. Uh, testified the USDA, uh, the Inspector General testified the USDA inspector noted that the cow was lying down when it arrived at the slaughter facility. Uh, this isn't a surprise to me. I've noticed this fact in every letter I've written on the subject, but is the veterinarian's assessment of whether the cow was lying down at the very de definition of a downer? Is it, the, is it that one moment in time when the cow was lying down that makes it a downer cow or not? Well, it seems clear that there's um, at least the potential for misunderstanding based on uh, differing definitions that seem to be floating around. But I think probably the way to consider this is through uh, a, a directive from the FSIS 6900.1, uh, revision number one from November of 1998. And uh, in that, the definition of, uh, of a downer cow, and let me read this into the record, is livestock that cannot rise from a recumbent position, parenthesis downer, or that cannot walk, including, but not limited to, those with broken appendages, severed tendons or ligaments, nerve paralysis, fractured vertebral column, or metabolic conditions. So the definition then is an animal that cannot rise. Okay. Now, Chairman Davis and I have received a sworn statement from the owner of the slaughter facility that the cow did get up after its examination by the veterinarian. Moreover, the veterinarian told congressional staff that he believed the cow's standing up after his exam was a distinct possibility. Right. Is your view that this cow was unquestionably a downer? Well, the definition, uh, based on what I've just read into the record, does not appear to be uh, based on a momentary assessment. If the, it, it's an animal that cannot rise, I read, at any moment in time. In fact, you, you appear to have, and they, from what I'm reading from your letter from yesterday, there are now a total of five people who have said that there was a moment at which it rose, maybe even most of its moments. Mm -hmm. And by that definition, it seems reasonable to conclude that it wasn't a downer. Now, th this is a matter I would have liked to pursue with the Inspector General. I'm going to send uh, written questions to her, and I appreciate your view on it. Uh, let me ask you one other question. Senior USDA officials have said that the discovery of mad cow disease is proof that our surveillance system worked as intended. But the <coughs> Inspector General found that several USDA employees knew that the slaughter facility had a special contract to test non-downers and, in fact, did test cows that were ambulatory by everybody's definition. Uh, without this uh, contract, which violated USDA policy, the owner says there would have been no cows tested at the slaughter facility at all. Do you think the system worked, or did we just get lucky in finding this a cow with mad cow disease? Well, clearly the practice at the, uh, at the plant appears to have been inconsistent with the U uh, USDA directives, so it's hard to say that uh, the system worked as intended. Uh, moreover, any claim of the effectiveness of the surveillance system uh, as being demonstrated by the detection of the cow is inconsistent with the way that USDA has, at least at times, presented the purposes of its surveillance system, and indeed the way I think everybody on this panel has, has 
put forth. The purpose of the surveillance system is, in fact, not to protect the, su the, the, the supply. It is, the purpose is to be able to estimate the prevalence. Now, if and we're estimating the prevalence, uh, do you think that, that we could say, as the Secretary has, that there's a one in a million or one in 10 million uh, that, that we're going to be able to detect cows in that kind of uh, scenario? Absolutely not. And um, for exactly the reasons that I have said, that Dr. Gray has said, and now that the USDA appears to be acknowledging that there is a non-zero risk um, among the lower risk animals. In fact, the IG report uh, makes the estimate uh, based on assumptions um, different than ours, but you know, in general of the same order, that um, 15 per 10 million, not one per 10 million, but 15 per 10 million is the limit on the detection of uh, at 268,000 well, animals. I appreciate that. And I see the, re uh, the yellow lights on, and I know I'm going to be gavel as soon as it's red. But if, if we had, uh, had there been a more honest assessment of the status of the cow, perhaps USDA would have avoided a mistaken assumption, which Secretary Veneman backed away from today, that all cows with mad cow disease would be downers or other high-risk cattle. This would have prevented misleading statements to the public about what the testing program can accomplish. Do you agree with that? I do. Thank you. Let me, uh, Dr. Lurie, let me start with you. Do you feel that uh, with the uh, new um, BSE surveillance program that, that at least the meat supply is safer today uh, than it was a year ago? I don't particularly think that because I don't think that the surveillance program is really about that. Um, the surveillance program is about estimating the extent of the disease. And um, so in that sense, I, I, you know, I don't think it, is, it makes much difference in that sense. I mean, as has been repeatedly pointed out, what protects us against BSC in this country is the import ban, the feed ban, and the SRM ban. This, uh, the surveillance system is about measurement, not really about protection. Okay. Uh, Dr. Gray, uh, I'll ask you to comment on that, but also you were tasked by the government to assess all aspects of USDA's uh, BSA surveillance program. In Dr. Lurie's testimony, which I heard in the back, he challenges many aspects of this program. Um, having reviewed this program as part of your work, do you have any comments? Sure. First of all, we weren't tasked. We were asked if we would review this, and it was something that we sort of did nights and weekends and a uh, little extra time to help out. When we looked at this, I think that if you look at our testimony, we fundamentally agree with the approach of looking at high-risk animals. Again, if we're going to look for BSE, let's look where we know the disease is. And all the data from countries that have much worse problems than we do suggests that the rate is much, much higher in, those dis in the um, animals that Europe dis somehow has a definition of downers that they use too. They're down stock, they're fallen stock, they're high risk animals. That's the place to look. The question of estimating prevalence, that's a di the difficult thing here is going to be what if we don't see any cases? How, what do we tell the American people about what we could have found if it was really there? That's what this one in 10 million fight is about. One in 10 million, but that prevalence can be estimated in a variety of different ways. And we suggest in our memo a couple of different ways of doing it. I think the important point here is not what exactly what that number is. And I think there will be quibbles. I think that the, um, the department has learned, we have learned, others have learned, as time has gone by, how to do a better job of estimating that. But at the end of the day, we'll be able to tell people that the, the rate in this country is probably very low. We can calculate it. We've got time to work on the data when it comes in. I think we'll do a good job of that. And then um, the third point is that we know what to do without surveillance. And this goes back to the point that surveillance is not our public health measure. We know what to do, and those steps have already been taken. Surveillance is going to be something that's going to help us figure out how well things are going. Okay. Um, let me ask uh, over here for Dr. Weber and, and Mr. Hodges. Um, uh, what effect does the disclosure of inconclusive uh, uh, rapid test results have on the cattle markets, in your opinion? Well, I think the prevailing opinion is that early on in this process, it will create significant volatility. Um, the way these tests have been designed and, and operated, according to the manufacturer and in other countries in Europe, in those settings, if they come up with an inconclusive, the odds are fairly high that it will be determined to be positive by the immunohistochemistry test. The way the test is being operated now, it is any one of these 
positive reactors is sent to Ames and declared and inconclusive. Uh, I think that the industry, the markets, I don't think will ever be desensitized by the number of these. They can't afford to. And so consequently, uh, we want to try to minimize the extent to which we have inconclusives, but not jeopardize the sensitivity of the testing system. That's not our objective. But we do want to make sure that good laboratory practice is in place, good procedures are in place, that we do not have an, an inordinate number of these because it will affect the market, I think, throughout the process. Uh, Mr. Chairman, it's AMI's belief that no results should be released until the results are confirmed using the most sensitive assays. Uh, releasing test results before they are confirmed may falsely suggest to consumers that there is a public health urgency uh, because the BSE agent is not contained in beef and because carcasses will be held or destroyed pending test results, we see no compelling need to communicate such preliminary and, as the name would suggest, inconclusive information. Okay. Finally, my last question to all of you, and I'll start with you, uh, Dr. Gray, is as of December 30th, non-ambulatory cattle are prohibited from entering the human food supply regardless uh, if they're exhibiting signs of CNS diseases or not. Uh, do you agree with the ban on downer cattle, and how effective do you think the ban is? I'm not dodging this, but one of the things we have studied BSE extensively, we've done analysis. We haven't looked at this whole problem. Everything that happens when we make a decision is going to have consequences. If we ban downers, they're going to go somewhere, and that could potentially create problems. I don't know if we've thought through this question all the way. I personally have it so that I, okay. this is not something I'm going to, I have a strong feeling on. Um, push it again. Um, I'm not going to dodge the question. Uh, I think that the decision to, to remove downer animals from human consumption is the correct decision. And uh, in terms of effectiveness, I think it will remove 24 percent, by my estimate, of the overall risk to American consumers. Um, I think that the, the policy is in place. I think it deserves a chance to work. Um, I, I'm encouraged by the data from the secretary that uh, they're doing a good job of getting animals that are dead on the farm, um, and that suggests to me that there's at least a good chance that this downer animal ban will not result in the hiding of, of, uh, of animals that uh, someone would prefer not to see tested. I, I just, and my, my time's up, but I would just opine, so then the food supply is safer than a year ago because of that downer for no other reason. No, I, I thought the question had to do with surveillance, and I said with respect to the okay. surveillance program, that that's not about surveillance. What makes the, the downer right. animals are safer because they can't be eaten, not because they're tested. Right, I got you. Okay, I got you. Right. Now, if you had answers, you don't have to answer my, my question in terms of the uh, ban on downer cattle. Uh, Mr. Chairman, AMI supports the uh, condemnation of cattle that exhibit clinical signs consistent with CNS uh, di disorders. We also support, uh, we are supportive of an inspection system that identifies and condemns cattle that fits certain scientifically based measures indicative of clinical BSE. However, AMI does not support wholesale condemnation of cattle based upon a broad definition of non-ambulatory uh, disabled status. Cattle may become non-ambulatory for a variety of reasons, both chronic and acute, and we believe that the department should carefully consider whether some of these animals would be acceptable for slaughter. I guess to add to that, uh, it's similar to the policy that uh, Jim Hodges has espoused. Uh, we have had concerns about denying access to the market for these animals. Uh, because we wanted to make sure we had them available for the surveillance program. I think that the success uh, this first uh, month of surveillance with over 17,000 samples indicates that USDA is effectively uh, gathering many of those, and that's going to continue. We do feel that many animals go to market that, uh, in, in, in an inhumane manner, which could be processed, especially by individuals who it's their own animal for their own consumption. And I think in contrast to some of the information that's been shared here today, it's my understanding if you look at the BSE and the risk in this uh, dead, down, diseased, able, disabled population, 
And in fact, if you look at it from a disease perspective in what's called the LD50s, the doses of infectivity, in Europe, that is over 96 percent of the potential risk of the BSE agent is in that population. So indeed, we dramatically are reducing risk when we remove animals over 30 months that may be non-ambulatory from the human food supply. Well, uh, Dr. Lurie, in his uh, written testimony, states that the removal of non-ambulatory or downer cattle from the human food supply will not greatly reduce the risk to humans. That's because, as he and many others have correctly noted, the testing system for BSE is a surveillance system. It's a system designed to determine whether the uh, problem exists. And if cattle don't get to the places where they're tested, then you're not getting full access to that information. So we um, point that out for the record. However, Dr. Lurie has also testified that the way you do prevent BSE from occurring are all things that the department is doing, and I think uh, uh, have increased those things that they're doing in terms of determining what uh, parts of cattle are allowed into the beef supply and, and how cattle can be fed. Um, Dr. Weber, Mr. Hodges, I wonder if you want to respond, as Dr. Gray had the opportunity to respond to Dr. Lurie's main contention, which seems to me to be that the old system, uh, most of his quarrels seems to be with the old system in terms of statistics. I think he has some disagreement with the current system as well, but I'd like you to give us your view of whether we are doing the necessary things to determine whether BSE uh, exists in our food supply and, and to what prevalence. Well, clearly, as, as you've said and, and others have reiterated, uh, the beef supply is safe because of the actions that have been taken. That's not a question. And it seems as if we're debating what the absolute prevalence number will be through this surveillance program. But it is, I think, quite honestly uh, the case. We will have an estimate from this, and that number will help us evaluate future BSE prevention measures in the United States. Mr. Hodges. The industry is far more concerned about whether BSE exists in this country to give us an indication of whether our preventative measures should be uh, reviewed and adjusted. It is less important to have the absolute uh, prevalence rate because we can calculate that rate. It's simply a matter of the confidence intervals that we have around that, uh, that rate, but we believe that the Department of Agriculture with their very aggressive sampling program is extraordinary. If you compare it to other countries, uh, other major exporting countries around the world, uh, they, test, uh, they test in hundreds or a few thousand compared to the hundreds of thousands that USDA now is uh, projected uh, to test. So uh, we believe that uh, this is a, a very good program Obviously, it will uh, require some refinements over the course of time, but fundamentally, it's in the industry's best interest to support it. Um, both of your organizations and the hundreds of thousands, not millions of people that uh, you represent in the uh, cattle business and in the uh, meat processing business have a great deal at stake here in terms of making sure that the confidence of the American consumer is high. Uh, I would take it that uh, you believe the best way to do that is to have a transparent system that assures the public that full testing is being done. Absolutely. Um, now, let me, let me address this issue briefly about the uh, cattle in Washington State. That was detected under the old system, not the new one, but there seems to be still some suggestions that uh, this was not a down cattle. I mean, the testimony is very direct. The Office of the Inspector General has conducted two investigations of this question, and their reports clearly established that the BSE positive cow sampled was a downer. Quoting from one of the investigations, ultimately the owner of Verns acknowledged that the animal identified as the BSE index cow was lying down in the trailer when it was presented to the USDA veterinarian for anti-mortem inspection. In fact, Tom Ellistead, the co-owner of Verns, uh, made numerous public statements refuting whether or not the cow was a downer. However, when interviewed by the Office of the Inspector General, Ellistead advised, I quote, 
at the time animal tag number 6810 was presented to the veterinarian medical officer, Thompson, it was lying down. Further, Ellistat explained that the cow was a downer at the time of slaughter and said if she had been prodded with a lot of effort, she probably could have gotten up. Ellistad said, however, that they were careful not to prod the, prod the downer animal due to humane handling purposes and instead stunned her while down. We'll make that statement and several others of other witnesses a part of the record. Will the gentleman yield? I would be happy to yield. I just want to point out that I think you're not quoting Mr. Elstead, but quoting somebody else who seems to be citing Mr. Elstead. Uh, perhaps we could leave the record open and have further information on what Mr. Elstead did or did not say. We would certainly uh, welcome the record to remain open for, Thank you. for clarification. Uh, the gentleman from Kansas, Mr. Moran, is recognized. Mr. Chairman, having just arrived, I don't have any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. You're bringing us to a, a rapid conclusion. Gentlemen, we thank you all for your participation in this uh, hearing today. And uh, I have a, some remarks I would like to share to bring this to a close. I'd like to close by saying that prior to today's hearing, a great many things have been said, either out of ignorance or malice, about the previous BSE surveillance program and the current expanded surveillance program that do great harm to our ability to shape a sound public policy. Anyone of clear mind who has reviewed the totality of the testimony presented today could only come to two obvious conclusions. First, that the cow tested in December was from the appropriate sampling population. And secondly, that while the BSE surveillance program in the past has had certain administrative failings, USDA is currently in the process of implementing a much improved, much expanded program and remains committed to ongoing improvements. As I observed in my opening statement, the Department of Agriculture's expanded BSE surveillance program is intended to take a snapshot of what is going on in this herd, this herd of 100 million head of cattle. The surveillance is not intended or designed to be uh, designed to prevent BSE. While not a direct protection measure itself, it will continue to contribute to the policy process determining our BSE defenses. The result of these tests will help shape how we maintain or modify the protective firewalls already in place, which include import bans on live cattle and certain ruminant products, feed bans prohibiting the feeding of most mammalian protein to ruminants, and exclusion of high-risk materials and high-risk animals in our food supply. As a result, I remain confident that uh, our food supply in this country, and most particularly our beef supply in this country, is of the highest quality. And I commend those uh, in the department uh, and those in the industry who have taken this matter very, very seriously. It is a serious matter, but it is also very important that we look at fact uh, and uh, in doing so, allow the American public to look at the facts that assure them that their food supply is very safe. Mr. Chairman. Gentleman from California. Uh, thank you, for Mr. Mr. Chairman. I, I wouldn't have objected for your uh, additional time, even though you had taken up your five minutes in questions. I just want to uh, say that uh, we all support the idea that we do the most effective job of protecting the consumers in this country from any uh, un unhealthy or unsafe food product. Uh, I think that uh, as we look at the situation of that uh, so-called downer cow, I think the question is a lot more open than my colleague uh, from Virginia would indicate. From what uh, we have seen from many instances of, uh, of evidence of testimony from people that were involved, I think we got lucky rather than uh, did the right thing uh, and that our system was well uh, tailored to meet the situation. What Seeing strikes me as the most important matter is that we be credible. We do what's necessary, and if we can't get a, um, a zero risk, or a one in 10 million, or even a one in one million uh, uh, kind of a reduction of risk, that we be honest about it. And I don't think that representations ought to be made citing Harvard <coughs> or citing anyone else when the evidence does not support those representations. I hope that the result of this hearing will be very constructive. I want the Secretary to succeed in the efforts of the Department. I think she should take to mind uh, all, uh, all the points raised by the Inspector General. I think the Inspector General found, uh, as if she were looking for uh, whether there was a criminal violation, uh, she found there was no intentional 
uh, misrepresentation, no wrongdoing. No one wanted to misrepresent the situation. But I think that was a very carefully phrased response to what uh, was a, a, a broader issue of whether that uh, cow uh, was a, a downer cow or not. The issue uh, is one under the USDA definition, and if that cow had the potential to get up and walk, it was not officially a downer cow, might not have otherwise been tested, and we might not have known what, what's going on in this, uh, uh, in this issue. I think we shouldn't make wrong assumptions and then follow through with policies that are based on wrong assumptions. And I think we ought to be honest with the American people about we can't, what we can and cannot do. We need to do the best we can do, but not, uh, not mislead people into thinking that we have solutions and then close our minds to uh, additional evidence that shows that uh, our, our assumptions may have been incorrect to start with. Thank you. I thank the gentleman for his comments. This, uh Debate will continue, and in fact, I'll ask unanimous consent that the record remain open for 10 additional days for the submission of answers to any questions raised by members of the committee uh, and for other uh, documentary information. And we'll make a, a, a notation that we want to see that final audit from the uh, uh, Office of the Inspector General, and that will probably take longer than that. So for that one item, we will hold the the opportunity well, to submit that uh, open later. Mr. Chairman, I know you've asked to request consent of this, and I won't disagree, but I do want to point out that to get those final audits from inspector generals can be a year or more. We're waiting for some of the reports that they're supposed to have done on uh, listeria and other matters. That's why it's important not to wait till the final audit, but uh, to make uh, use uh, of interim uh, reports so that we can learn from and, and let the public know about well, me, those interim reports. But if, they, if the re final report comes in, I think it ought to be part of the record. We're advised that it'll be much shorter than that, but we will make sure that that is, is uh, made a part of the record. And uh, uh, again, I would uh, point out that uh, taking an audit that is incomplete is uh, uh, inappropriate when the party who being audited has not had an opportunity to respond. We like a bank examiner uh, taking an audit and publishing it before the party that there's being examined has an opportunity to produce whether they have a receipt to demonstrate this or that or the other activity well, I'm going to disagree place. with you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. but I don't know if we want to prolong the debate. I I, I'm not going to prolong the debate. You've had two, two cracks at it, and I think we'll, we'll call it there. We, we will wait for that final audit, uh, and we will also continue to work uh, with you and everybody who's been involved with this to make sure that we do have uh, a safe food supply in this country. With that, the hearing will be adjourned. Thank you.